I only pledge allegiance first to the flag. Then we'll please stand if you would with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take this moment, uh, uh, just a temporary moment of silence for, for two volunteers, that longtime volunteers that have passed within the last week and a half here. Uh, one is Peter Lucas, I mentioned at our last meeting that uh, long time, very long time volunteer, especially with the, what was the Roads Committee is now Infrastructure Committee. And mm -hmm. I'm sad to say to everybody that Beverly Correll, our uh, chairman of the Board of Adjustments and longtime election chairman, passed away also. So if we could take a moment, just a moment of silence, please. Two great people. Yeah. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> um, uh, I will move to, is there a motion for the adoption of the agenda? Motion. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bauer, second by Commissioner Persinger. Any further discussion? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna try some, instead of just reading off names, I'm gonna say, is, are there any nays? All right, are, all in favor say aye. 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 Are there any are there any abstentions? Then, then it's unanimous. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, do you do you need to do a roll call for the meeting to be official? I, just I, to... I intend to do that, yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I jumped over roll call and <clears> hit <throat> the pledge and um, we have Commissioner Jasinski. Aye. Commissioner Persinger. Here. Commissioner Stevens. Here. Commissioner Bauer. Here. The mayor, Commissioner Cook is here. And along with our <clears throat> town, new town manager, Mr. Bill Zolber. Here. And our assistant town manager, Mr. Jim Deedes. Here. And our town attorney, Mr. Fred Townsend. And Mr. Townsend, that last was not last but not least. Um, okay, we've done the adoption of the agenda. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit differently on the minutes. To, we have the minutes from you have the minutes from January eighth, Commissioner's Town Meeting. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. By Mr. Mr. Bauer has a motion to accept. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Persinger. All in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Any abstention? Unanimous. You also have the meeting minutes for January 13th, Special Commissioner's Town Meeting minutes. Uh, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Persinger? So moved. Second by Mr. Bauer. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? Any abstention? <laughs> Unanimous. Um, I personally don't remember receiving, and I may have, and I apologize, the executive session minutes for January 8th and January 13th. Were, were they sent out? Yes. I apologize, Mr. Bauer, I did not see them. They, they were they were in the same file as the main meeting minutes, just FYI. Okay, I apologize for that. Uh, then the, you have the January 8th executive session meeting minutes. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. By Mr. Jasinski. Second. Second by Mr. Persinger. Sorry, I missed the hand up there, Mr. Persinger. You're waving it quickly on me. Then motion to accept and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Any abstention? Unanimous. That's January 8th. 
to the January 13th executive session meeting minute. You all have them. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, is there a motion to accept the January 13th executive by Mr. Persinger? Motion to accept. I move to accept. Is there a second? Second. No, she'll let you in the second by Mr. Bauer. Um, properly moved and second. No, 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 you're fine. Thank you. Excuse me. Oh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any against? And any abstentions? I'm going to actually, if you will uh, read my abstention for the last two votes, I uh, I said it publicly that I had not seen those minutes, so I didn't feel I could vote on them. I just simply abstained. Uh, as of right now, there's nobody set up for committee reports that I know of. Um, Ashley, is there anybody in the waiting room for public comments at this time? Yes, um, it appears as of right now, we have five people waiting. Mm -hmm. And they want to do public comments or they can do public comments now and or they can do public comments when we have discussion on various items. So they want public comments now if you'll lead them in. So the first person is Jason Goldblatt. Mr. Goldblatt, this is Dale Cook. How are you, sir? Hi, hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you, sir? Very good. Uh, you have uh, three minutes to make your comments. These are general comments at this time. Uh, is this the right opportunity for me to ask a specific question about the zoning, or sh or should I wait until? It's in front of the council. Well, I, no, you can actually comment on anything at this time, and okay. I will actually have comments at, on specific items that like zoning, but it's not a question and answer period. It's a comment period. Sure. So you can comment and then the sure. Go ahead, sir. Will do. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jason Goldblatt, and I'm a current homeowner in Dewey Beach and also um, the contract purchaser of a property on Cullen Street where I intend to build a home for my family in the next year or so. Um, I had a clarifying question, which I'll, I'll let the council consider when they come to it, but relating to section 10 of the new ordinance regarding grandfathering. Um, in my discussions with town administrators, I was told that in order to qualify under the current zoning law, I would need to file an application for permit prior to the expiration of the proposed six months from the date of the new zoning laws enacted. Um, and I just wanted to confirm that this was in fact the case in order to qualify under the old zoning. Um, and I don't need an answer now. Again, I'm just laying it out there. And then um, in well, addition- Let me, let me comment first, that Mr. Townsend, first. not right now, but when we get to that subject area, would you make sure you bring that subject up and make a comment at that time? Thank you, Mr. Townsend, I appreciate your mic's off. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Goldblatt. Mr. Johnson, was that clear what I was asking? I believe so. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, in, in the beggars but can't be choosers category, um, I'd also ask if the council would consider allowing folks even a bit more time to extend the grandfather provision to nine, nine or even 12 months. Um, given all the delays with the pandemic and given folks like me that are buying properties now, it's just a, a little bit more challenging this, in this environment to get everything planned and designed. But again, that's that's uh, beggars can't be choosers. But Thank at, you. At, Thank again, you, as I said, I apologize. It's not a question and answer session. Sure. Mr. Townsend, you had your hand up. You wanted to be recognized. Just a quick thing, and I know we can talk about this in more detail um, when we get to the agenda item. Um, I, it's probably not uh, appropriate to characterize that Section 10 as a grandfathering provision so much as it is a delayed effective date so that the existing zoning remains in effect until such time as this ordinance, if passed, goes into effect, which, which as presently proposed wouldn't be for six months following its enactment. Yeah, I apologize. Those are my, my words. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> no, no reason to apologize. It's just that uh, if we give the public the impression that there is a grandfathering provision, they might come away with it thinking that the, the law never applies to them. Uh, I see. And uh, that's, that's not the case. 
Thank you, Mr. Sir. Townsend, if you take the time to address that subject when we actually get into mm -hmm. item number two. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Goldblatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ashley, do you have the next one in line? Yes, the next one is Lynn Shoup. Oh, great. <laughs> Lynn Shoup, how are you? Thank you, Mr. Sir. Townsend, if you take the time to address that subject when we actually get into mm -hmm. item number two. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Mr. Goldblatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, Ms. Shoup, if you could turn off your, your, uh, your other connection to the meeting so that we don't hear a delay. Okay, do I have it off now? Sounds fine. Yeah. Yes, I believe you do. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much for calling in. Um, thank you guys. Um, as always, thanks for your time, your energy, your attention, and your service to the community. Um, you've heard me speak a number of times before about the zoning, proposed zoning changes. And I just wanted, I don't need to repeat everything I've said in the past. I think everyone's well aware of the different positions and the data out there. But I did want to um, point out, and I should have emailed, but I didn't, that I, I fully get why the delayed effect um, would put, be put in place with some of, with respect to the provisions that are more restrictive. Um, but I'm, I guess, requesting that somehow you build in there that some of the provisions that actually allow um, a greater use of your property, the, the corner set, setback um, changes, corner lot setback changes make, if, if, if you decide to vote today, which I very much hope you do, because those of us with corner lots um, who may benefit from some of these changes have been waiting. I, I have plans sitting, waiting to submit. Um, I would just ask that, you know, A, you vote one way or the other, whatever you decide, make a vote and a decision so that we can decide what we're doing with our properties. And then also perhaps build something in there that allows those more res less restrictive provisions to be used currently. Because I think what would happen if, if there's a six month delay or a nine month delay on the effectiveness of the provision, I would have to submit my plans um, with taking advantage of the new provisions and then they would be declined and then I would have to appeal and pay the $500 appeal in order to, um, you know, we personally are just looking for two feet. We need two more feet in order to, um, complete a, a project that we're doing. So, so I'm not really making a lot of sense. I didn't write this down this time, but somehow um, the, the the people that have been waiting for this to be passed in order to affirmatively um, complete building projects could take advantage of it immediately. Whereas people that are um, negatively impacted by it are given that grace period or the mm -hmm. delayed effectiveness. So somehow we could work that into it. That would be wonderful. And that's just my comment today. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Shoup. Okay, thank We you. always appreciate your comments. Aww. Ashley, if you'll. We have, this just says 110 Jersey. Mm. Not coming in. I'll bring another in while we're waiting. Christopher Gross. Who's that? Is it Christopher Gross? Gross. Mr. Gross, you might have your audio off. Your microphone is off. There we go. How you doing? Are you there? And I will turn on the screen. How you doing? It was. We, You're on, Chris. Okay, go ahead, sir. Mr. Gross, go ahead. Okay. Hold on, I'm gonna wait for um, the presentation is gonna be done by Kevin Zelinsky. 
Say that again, Mr. Gross. Um, the presentation is going to be done by Kevin Zielinski. He should be entering. Chris, Chris. Yeah. That, that isn't on the agenda yet. We'll let you know when the agenda starts on the uh, GIS surveys. Cool. Thank you. Sorry about that. This is public comment area mm -hmm. right now. Sorry about that. Ashley, you have another person? We have Matt. I don't want to mess up his last name. Matt Z. Actually, you might want to ask him if he's with uh, Remington Vernick. Matt? He's in. Here I am. Go right ahead, Mr. Is it Mr. Zakutney? Yes, uh, that's me. Thank you. I tried my daughters to get it right there. <laughs> Go right ahead. This is a public comment session. You can make a public comment now and also anytime during the meeting when we come to a specific subject. Well, I'm really just here um, to help out Kevin Zielinski. Yes. As, uh, I'm working with Kevin on the full length lining down there in Dewey Beach. Okay. This is. This is not the time for that for that section of the meeting yet. I apologize. No, no uh, I, I was on hold, so I'll leave now, and you guys can invite me back in when you're ready. <laughs> Thank you. One more. It's Mike C. Um, so bring him he in. He may also be. And with, he's the last one. Then the rest of the um, individuals in the waiting room are all with Remington and Vernick after this one. Jim, Mike, Mike might also be with Mr. Zelensky, is that correct? He, uh, I believe the other person, is his name is Matt. <clears throat> but I... We'll find out very quickly. Right. Mike, see, you need to turn on your mic. There you go. And your video. Mike, are you there? One more did just join. It's David Moskowitz. Do you want me to bring him in while we wait to see if Mike is <laughs> Yes, please. Go ahead. And you say it's David Moskowitz? Correct. Mr. Wa oh, Mr. Moskowitz, this is Dale Cook, Mayor. You're, you're on the public comment section at the beginning of the meeting. We also have comments as we go down through the agenda. So go right ahead. This is a comment, but not a question and answer period. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Moskowitz. I live here full time with my daughter. Um, live here, work here. Um, I, I just wanted to wish Bill Zolper a good luck. Uh, his background is very impressive and very excited to have a town manager of that nature in Dewey Beach. And then I, I wanted to call because I've had some concerns. Um, the town paid about 150 grand in the past for the last FOIA incident. And previously they had other FOIA incidents where uh, there's been legal fees incurred. And in the January 27 marketing committee meeting, and it was led by a commissioner liaison, um, they were just discussing agenda items and doing votes where they shouldn't have not. It was not noticed on the agenda. And then that was followed up with the February 5th budget committee meeting where they had a vote they shouldn't have. So I'm asking the town to consider there's experts in this area. You have Max Walton, who's very well known, and you have Glenn Mandelis, who's also well known in FOIA law. And what the town used to do in the past is they used to get all the committee head and commissioners in a room and say, this is the FOIA information you need to know. This is the attorney general presentation. And it would be really good if the town could just get one of those two lawyers, Rehoboth does it, and just have all the commissioners and committee chairs 
there and say, this is foyer, this is how you run a meeting, this is what the state allows, especially the state has changed a lot of stuff. So it's just good to do and it would reduce legal liability. So I really would like to see the town consider spending. I, I, I know money is tight, but it'd be money well spent, sort of like taking defensive driving if you're driving a car. And then my last comment is the hotels have been hit very hard, but they still, they, right now they pay zero to Dewey and they should pay something. It's the state issue is a state issue, but it would be nice if the commissioners considered letting the hotel tax start July 15th, July 1st, or even August 1st, just to give them a little extra time to get their feet on and do well. Because I think this summer is going to be amazing and uh, I'm looking forward to it, but uh, it would be nice if the commissioners considered starting the hotel tax a little bit later than April 1st, if you do vote for one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moskowitz. Is that all? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll have, a, again, everyone will have a, a chance that, especially with the zoning uh, and throughout the meeting to have public comments, Ashley, if you'll, uh, some way, if, is there a way to fill them in on that, Ashley, that uh, I can send a message in the waiting room, but um, everyone doesn't necessarily check those messages. So I will send gotcha. it. Gotcha. Um, and just, it's being. Okay, I understand. You know, it, if, uh, if maybe when you, anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you very much, Ashley. Sure. And the uh, remaining individuals are the four individuals who are waiting from Remington Vernick. They're from Vernick? Remington Vernick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. This light is automatic here. <laughs> Thank you all. I'll have to do that every so often. Uh, then we'll move on to the next item, which is, I believe, action item for discussion uh, and uh, storm drainage infrastructure project status update by Kevin Zielinski of Remington and Vernick Engineers. Mr. Didis, uh, you're scheduled to host that part of the meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to give just a little orientation for some of our town managers and the public uh, regarding how we got to where we are today. Back in January of 2019, town administration worked with our town planner who works with Remington Vernon engineers. And it, we asked for a proposal to provide a GIS uh, stormwater mapping uh, system and uh, a database for us to deal with our stormwater drainage issues since we had nothing on the books. Uh, they submitted a proposal that included identifying the map existing stormwater management facilities. If we're gonna do land surveying and provide a GPS uh, data collection. And then we're gonna televise, uh, televise pipe to analyze where water uh, flows and where it doesn't flow. So the initial mapping that they were to do uh, involved Rodney Avenue, Reed Street, McKinley Street from Route 1 to Roboth Bay. And it was la later expanded to include Sweet Street, to Bellevue Street, Bayside along Barrett Avenue. The commissioners um, in June approved uh, the town commissioner to uh, allow them to start work. We proposed a budget. So we've met several times with, uh, from 2019 to 2020 with Remington Burning, and we've worked extensively with Chris Fazio and Kevin Zelensky. Uh, they provided the study they provided the uh, wherewithal to get the mapping and done. And we would have, pre we were initially proposing to have this presented uh, early spring. Well, of course, COVID came in and everything was put on the back burner. So now we are where we are. And we really wanted to provide that as an in-service, uh, an in-person presentation, but obviously where we are resulted in doing it via Zoom. So Kevin Zelensky has prepared a PowerPoint presentation for the commissioners to look and to review and to bring everybody up to date as to what has happened and where we are and what proposals they have for us and recommendations they have. So if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Zelensky. Mr. Didis, I have one question of you. Yes, sir. Uh, as I understand it, we're gonna go through with the presentation and then we'll have time afterward for any questions from the from the uh, commissioners and the town managers. That is correct. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Didi. 
Uh, Kevin, are you on the line? I am. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, turn it over to Kevin. Go ahead, Mr. Zelensky. All right. Thank you. Um, first off, I want to uh, thank the commissioners for allowing us to uh, present today um, and give you an overview as well as an update and recommendations on the GIS firmware infrastructure uh, management project that we're doing for the town. Um, quickly, if I, if I may, uh, I would like to um, introduce our, our, uh, everyone online here. Again, my name is Kevin Zielinski. I am the GIS uh, CAD manager for Remington and Vernick Engineers. We also have Chris Fazio. He's our, um, he is a shareholder uh, and a, our PE. Uh, for Remington and Vernick Engineers, representing Conshohocken in Delaware. We have um, Christopher Gross, he is my GIS administrator. And we also have representative uh, from Standard Pipe Services, uh, Matt Zakutny, uh, is on the line as well to answer any questions you may have. So, Ashley, if I can, if I can share the screen, I'd like to bring up a PowerPoint, if I could. Yes, you should have access in the bottom. Do you see where it says share screen? Yep, I do. And let me know if everyone can see this. Yes, it's good. Yeah, great. All right. Again, thank you, uh, Matt mm -hmm. and, and commissioners for allowing us to have your time today. Um, again, a quick overview. Um, we met about two years ago, uh, around this time, actually, um, with the town because... Um, they, they wish to create a GIS stormwater infrastructure database um, according to state guidelines, and we are using the latest ArcGIS uh, software application uh, to both create a map as well as collect and import GPS collected information uh, from the field. Uh, we understand the town's best interest uh, was to determine the current conditions of your stormwater infrastructure. Uh, before spending funds to address these isolated areas. Uh, there were four primary tasks that we, were, uh, that we were authorized to perform. One was obviously to identify and map any existing uh, facilities, uh, both in a CAD or, or an as-built document format. Uh, we contacted obviously uh, local, local resources at the town of Dewey Beach. We also uh, contacted Sussex County um, as well as uh, resources we compiled ourselves from, from performing work within the town. Um, next thing, we supplemented that information by going out and performing a GPS collection, where we went out and we collected any unknown assets that either weren't covered by as built um, and or, or uh, information that was pointed out to us by, by, uh, by the town, uh, uh, needed areas, if you will. The third phase was obviously to target that area and televise the pipe, clean it, and to assess its condition. Um, you know, where it was not draining properly and, uh, you know, if there was any repairs needed. And then the fourth task was to then make that information available through a web application, which we, we, have, uh, we have an example of that as well. And if we have time today, we can show that to you. Um, what we agreed to do um, was to uh, define a pilot area. So this pilot area, uh, which was the area of concern to go ahead and inventory this infrastructure and map it and document it, was uh, from the Rodney Avenue, Reed and McKinley Street area between uh, the, from, um, actually it wasn't from the ocean. That's, that's a misprint, I apologize. It was Rodney Ave, Reed and McKinley Street, basically from uh, SR1 to the Bay. And I have a map that I can show you of that area defining it. Um, again, wanted to verify and map the stormwater pipes in that area, which included the structures and outfalls. Um, we again designated that area as the pilot area and standard pipe services was retained to perform that pipe cleaning and the televising. And I have samples to show you of that where water is collecting and not draining pop properly in that area. Um, specifically, and I don't know if you can, can, can everybody see my mouse kind of moving around here? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, folks, we're basically the Baird Suite area from Coastal Highway all the way down to um, 
Rodney Street and then to the bay was the area of concern that we have identified uh, to map those structures, collect whatever was in, uh, information was available, and then, uh, and then have the uh, pipe cleaning crew go out there and televise and document uh, those structures. Uh, with that, we compiled an inventory map that you're looking at right here. So the stormwater system facilities were mapped based on that existing collected information and GPS work that we, so we collected everything from store manholes, inlets and catch basins to the outfalls. Um, we were able to collect rim and grate inverts. We identified it by number. Uh, I know it's hard to see, but we, we do have blow up uh, versions to, for, uh, for the commissioners to see. Um, the pipe schematic as well as size, type and slope, length and the flow directions. And, uh, and obviously your booster station, your pump down on Baird Street, that was a particular concern. Um, actually, uh, before I jump to the next slide, uh, commissioners, if you would indulge me, uh, one of the things that we discussed was um, this purple area on Reed Street, if you can see from SR1 to the Bay, and this purple area up here, which is um, uh, Swedes along Baird to Salisbury this kind of uh, up, uh, upside down L shape what was, was the uh, year one priority. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but these are all numbered. Uh, along here, we have structure 33, 34, all the way down to 67. And up here we have 62, 49, 04, 07, and 10. And those numbers are important and you'll see why. So, the area uh, that I described from Coastal Highway to the Bay, starting at Structure 33, you're actually looking down here, uh, they are identified by number. These are photographs that we took in the field when we GPS collected that asset. This is actually Structure 33 on Coastal Highway. All the way down, including uh, 36, and this is in wet conditions. And then when the water receded, dry conditions, um, 39, which up here is underwater. These are, these are structures that we found along Reed Street, starting at Coastal Highway right before the new work where they uh, reconstructed the outfalls at the bay. Um, if you see structure four and five, these are up in the Swedes, uh, Swedes, Swedes, rare Salisbury area that you saw in the northern part in that purple area. These are the conditions uh, at the time of what we collected in that area, uh, which is represented here with four and five. These are some static photos of the pipe conditions uh, within those structures. So it, you can clearly see here, and this is up in that northern section, if you see my mouse, this shows catch basin 46 to catch basin four. Um, and it was done uh, February 26th of last year, just about a year ago. Um, this actually is, is in good condition. This shows good flow. Um, it, is, it is moving the water and it doesn't seem to appear to be any, um, any compromise in the pipe. And that's identified in a yellow area. And again, I'll cover that in a little bit. Um, five to four, same thing in the upper right corner. But if you notice, uh, further along from four to five, we have a break in the pipe or a disconnection in the sections. And if you notice here, folks, in the middle image, there's actually, I think, a bottle, might be a beer bottle that's wedged in between that uh, separation of the two pieces of RCP. And then the lower left is the same image with a report that, that uh, the S SPS folks, uh, when they did their cleaning and inspection, was able to document. Direction upstream, height is 18 inches, <clears throat> circular pipe, it is re reinforced concrete pipe, um, which documents, and there's a report I will show you, uh, you know, that complements uh, this, this video. In the lower right, you see structure 44. It is uh, actually partially collapsed with debris. So these are some of the, uh, some of the uh, information that was documented with the video in, the, in this pilot area. Here you see a report 
that, that complements that video from Catch Basin 5 to 4, if you see it up here in the upper right uh, corner. And in this report, it's, it's hard to see here, but I did blow it up. Uh, report remarks where the inspection showed abandoned surcharge debris, which we did just see, major sag, liner needed, lots of offset and separated joints. So these were some of the observations that were made where you had a lot of inflow, um, debris, possible sinkholes and collapse. Uh, now you see this is a blow up of that earlier overall map for the town of, uh, town of Dewey Beach. Um, one of the areas of concern that we've identified and attention commissioners to the lower left where we ranked or rated uh, from our inspection, uh, the uh, pipe maintenance priority list. Um, if everybody no uh, notices here, you'll see number 69, 79, and 60. This is actually at the bay at the end of Reed Street where the new um, three 36 inch RCPs were just installed with the um, so if you notice the yellow areas down here, no immediate repairs needed. Those are areas where it was either new construction or if you saw that nice video that showed the nice clear pipe, the integrity was good, it was flowing, there was no debris, there was no, there was no compromise of the, of the integrity of the pipe. So obviously new construction, that's yellow. We noticed up here 50, 51 and 55 was in the same condition. Um, the purple area, which is structures 33, 34, 36, 39 to 67, where it comes up to that junction box to the new construction. And then the cross members uh, or the laterals picking up the, other, the north side of Reed, which is 40, 38 and 37 are highlighted in purple. Um, they are candidates for relining where um, they're starting to show some signs of degradation, however, and, and, and they would be a, like a first year priority, if you will. Um, but removal replacement is not necessary. Uh, they are definitely candidates to reline, which would um, uh, correct or, or uh, um, the integrity of the pipe would be restored, the flow would be improved, and uh, the life cycle of the pipe would be, would be much extended uh, if that service was performed. When you see the beige area here, that, that is uh, not as, not as um, degraded as the purple area. And we classified that as a, like a year two to five um, priority where you could address that in, in, uh, after year one. Yellow, obviously, no, no repairs needed. They, that, they were fine. The beige area, if you see like up here from 56 to 49, that was areas where, where we could access it. We were able to see it and video it. However, heavy cleaning still needed. Uh, they were not able to perform a, a cleaning for a variety of reasons. Uh, they could not dewater it. Um, there was, uh, they felt that if they, if, if they proceeded with the cleaning, it was gonna compromise the integrity of the pipe and cause more damage than not. Um, the gray area here uh, from the 45 looping around to 44, uh, there, there was no accessibility uh, at all. It was totally packed, either silted up, full of water or, or debris and, and uh, was not able access it at all. So five primary uh, color codes, shape, uh, well, decent shape, uh, candidate for relining, we would, we would classify it as a year one priority. Uh, beige area is uh, uh, better than purple, can wait you know, from a two to five year uh, uh, capital improvement. Um, the brown area is, was accessible, but, but still still needs to be cleaned for a variety of reasons, was not able to be done. Yellow is fine, gray you couldn't access at all. So that is kind of the color coding theme that we, that we uh, rated everything going forward. Here's an example of the uh, GIS that we built for the town of Dewey Beach, where we took the video, we took that reporting, 
And it is a web browser available to the commissioners to be able to go online and click on an asset, like here's Reed Street again, on between structures 34 and 36. And you can actually see that here. And you can see it's an 18 inch pipe, the material, uh, the recommendation from the report gathered was, was a relining. It's a candidate to be relined. And the video that you can actually view from that asset is also attached. Again, this is a static uh, picture of, of, that, of that image. Here, uh, same thing, folks. This is the northern part. We were talking about C Swede Street along Bear to Salisbury. This was the candidate where uh, it is a year one where the, the, the pipe's starting to degrade. However, it does not have to be removed and replaced. It is a candidate to be relined, and we would rate that as a year one priority. Uh, you see the yellow and the beige. Um, I did neglect to point out the blue. If you see the blue here, and uh, Jim, you might be able to speak to this. This area from 47 to 58 is totally compromised. Uh, pipe has collapsed. Uh, basically, the only thing holding it up is the debris that it is packed with. If we began, it, it's a candidate for remove and replace. Uh, we found this area here between three and four is collapsed. And this area here between 47 and 58 is not, it's either collapsed or the CMP, it's metal pipe has been uh, exposed, uh, open, and we can actually see inside of it. Um, if that's something that we were to dig out, it probably would fall in our that is a, uh, that would, we would rate these two areas as a remove and replace. But again, you see the purple, the yellow, the beige, and the gray. Um, here again, same, same, uh, same uh, uh, static photo, if you will, of the same area where here again, from this structure, we can click on that asset. It's a 15 inch pipe, it's an RCP and the video that's attached. This happens to be, I believe, this pipe here would be say a two to a five year uh, consideration. Um, a lot of it was in good shape. There were a couple uh, separations starting to show, but, but it was a candidate that can be kind of weighted uh, down the road uh, for a two to five year capital improvement. Um, our assessment, most of, the, most of the existing system is a candidate for relining, which can be performed uh, over the next one to five years, depending on the condition and priority. And again, referring to that map. The remainder of the study area either needed to be, uh, either needs to be removed and replaced or reconstructed due to broken, corroded or collapsed structures. And again, similar to the Dickinson Street issue that we spoke about earlier, Jim, uh, uh, last year. Uh, or the structures were inaccessible due to water infiltration, uh, existing structures too deteriorated and unstable to continue with the jetting and utilizing as these structures would have been made worse versus just leaving them intact. Uh, these areas could also be candidates for either relining or reconstruction to be determined after ability to access and televise for assessment. And again, that's more of that brown and gray areas that I, that I had pointed out. The recommendations, and again, here's where that color coding comes into play. Uh, for budget purposes and working, uh, working with, uh, with the um, with standard pipe services, uh, we recommended the following color coded breakdown, uh, which is also on those maps. The blue, as I expressed, was, uh, was an excavation and replace. Um, just too far gone to, to try to save. The purple areas, which we're classifying as a phase one candidate for relining in year one. Um, the orange, uh, again, candidates for relining, better integrity than the purple, and that could be a, a year two to five, depending on uh, which, which one that the town might want to address first, or perform other types of repairs. The brown was accessible, but heavy cleaning still needed. We could see in it, but we couldn't dewater it. Uh, the tidal issues or heavy rain just or debris just wasn't able to fully uh, clear it to make that assessment. We're not going to get into it at all. 
And yellow is in good shape. No repairs needed at this time. Um, I want to bring uh, uh, the attention of the commissioners to this slide. This is um, the uh, price quote that uh, Jim, we had discussed with, uh, with Bill, your manager. Um, upon further review and really digging in and, and uh, reviewing and researching, um, you know, the, these were the worst case scenarios for the town of Dewey. Um, those several areas, indulge me, we're talking from that structure, if you recall, 33 right here, uh, SR1, Coastal Highway, 34, which is a single pipe, from 34 to 36 is a double 18 inch RCP, 30 to 39 is a double 15 inch RCP, 39 to 67 is a double 18 inch RCP, and these these 40 to 67, 38 to 39, 37 to 36 are single 15 inch RCPs. The excavated were needed and relined, cleaned and relined. Of course, we already did the out vault here. And then 62 to 46, to four, to seven, to 10, and 10 to nine, calling the Baird Avenue. Uh, the Reed Street that I just described, these pipes would include the M tube liner with AO, AOC resin procedure. Work would be performed concurrently with low tide condition. And the prices include cleaning, telephoning again if needed, plugging bypass pumping and groundwater control and dewatering as necessary. And it's the heavy cleaning anticipated between that catch basin 40 and 67. And the reason that we pointed that out, at the time the outfalls are being constructed at the end of Reed, uh, the construction equipment from that contractor blocked SPS from gaining access to that. But we're, we're presuming that there are similar conditions as the other cross pipes uh, more toward the ocean side going along Reed Street. So that Kevin, cost Kevin, in, can in, I, in Reed Street. Kevin, yes, sir. I just want to, I want to interrupt for one second. Can you explain Please. what M2 Bliner and AOC are for everybody to understand in layman's terms? Um, Matt, I'm going to hand that part off to you because I don't want to speak for you. If you can explain that process, please. I was just pulled away for one minute. I'm just catching back up. What? What's the, the question was, uh, uh, Jim asked for the commissioners, if you could explain the M2 liner and AOC resin process. Okay, so let me start from the beginning of it. So the first thing that they're gonna, they're gonna do is they're gonna get up to a catch basin, okay? They're gonna take off that catch basin lid and they're gonna find the end of the, end, the next end of the catch basin, they're gonna take off that catch basin lid, okay? From the first catch basin, they're gonna start shooting the tube, the liner down the pipe. It's kind of like a sock where one side of it has the resin on it, which is the AOC resin. The other side of it has this polypropylene uh, feel on the inside, kind of like, um, like the same material as a PVC. But on the, on the other side is the resin, which is like with a felt. The felt and the resin, believe it or not, that's where the strength comes from. As they're shooting this liner through the pipe using pressure from steam, it inverts. And as it goes through the pipe, the, the plastic side goes on the inside of the pipe and the resin goes on the outside adhering to the original pipe that you're talking about, talking about the corrugated metal or the RCP. And as it goes all the way through, it shoots, literally will shoot out the other end of the catch basin, sometimes in the air. Um, and then they hold that pressure there for about two hours with, uh, with like, you know, and they, they heat that pipe up to like 150 degrees and then they slowly cool it down. As it, and as it cools down to about 110 degrees, that's when they can open up each end, cut, cut everything open, and then you have your, your new pipe inside the pipe. So the M tube liner is your polypropylene uh, lining material that goes inside the pipe, and the AOC resin is, 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 the, is the stuff that gives it to structural strength on the outside of it. Um, 
And when it's all complete, it looks like a CIPP liner. If you hold for a minute, I can go grab an example for it and show it to you real fast. And again, while he's getting that, Jim, uh, when, the nice thing about it is it, it fills in those compromises, those gaps, if you will, once it's clean and, and it, it, it restores the integrity of the pipe so, so it will not collapse on itself. And the, the velocity of the water, there's less turbidity. It just basically flows better through a, a nice, clean, smooth pipe versus the, the dips and, and, and the uh, roughness of a, of a concrete pipe, if you will. And if you look at the picture here, you can see this is the felt on the outside and on the inside. You can see that it's, you know, it looks just like a PVC liner. And then when it's cured, this is a sample. The green stuff is the PVC pipe. The white stuff inside here is our liner. And you can see it looks just like the regular PVC on the inside by the time it's cured. Are you, are you showing us the liner? Because all I see is the page of specifications and estimates. You got to probably pull up my picture somehow. I don't know how to blow uh, myself up. No, I can see it, Mr. Mayor. You have to go over to the side and look at the pictures of the uh, attendees in the meeting. In lieu of his face. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Mr. Mayor, if you, if you, if you look at Matt Zakutney's uh, Brady Bunch Square. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Go ahead. Okay. I'm a dinosaur. I'll ruin it. What, um, good question. What's the life expectancy normal after you do that uh, on a pipe like that? You know, uh, these are these pipes that we're putting in the ground. Um, you know, everybody marks it markets it as a 50 year life. Some people market it as a 100 year life, um, believe it or not. So we, we purchase our material from in situ form. In situ form, um, their material, their M2 material is a 100 year life material. So you're getting a new pipe inside the pipe. Thank you. And, and the yeah. advantage to uh, commissioners uh, for this is, first of all, you don't, it's a lot cheaper than ripping it out and replacing it, for one thing. It's already in place. Um, and again, the, the, the exercise we went through with these tasks is to identify the pipes that were candidates to perform this process. Mr. Zielinski, I'm going to hold off for a minute. And Jim, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on the rest of your questions. And I, I have a few questions that I, I have a few questions that I want to ask just to put a baseline here and then move to the, the other commissioners. Mr. Stevens had his hand up after I did. So uh, first, Jim Deedes, uh, I want you to explain, if you would, to the commissioners in general and very quickly, the 1983 agreement that allowed the town to control and monetize the right of ways and therefore also uh, made the town responsible for for uh, the drainage system? Uh, I regret to, yeah, I, uh, I'll be happy to explain, but the bottom line is the, the way I understand the agreement, they are responsible for Route 1 and Route 1 catch basins only, nothing else. Uh, we've, uh, I remember our, one of our former town managers had asked uh, me to FOIA the state and the county uh, regarding and, and, and the Department of Natural Resources, DELDOT included, as to who would be responsible, who takes ownership for any of our other streams. There is no agreement, there's no understanding, and it was left, from what we gathered was, it really becomes our responsibility to handle that. That's how it is. That's so basically, Mr. basically, Mr. Didi, uh, that's the base of where the town becomes responsible or became responsible in 1983 for the existing drainage system. That, that's what I would assume. We were hoping yes. somebody else had ownership of it, but nobody else does. But the 1983 agreement does that. Secondly, it covers that. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. Secondly, um, so that people can understand, Mr. Zelensky, um, can you explain how your the the possibility of mobilization of equipment and timing is affected, um, or excuse me, how that mobilization of equipment affects timing and cost. The other day we talked about, you know, if you could mobilize one time and do a whole area at one time, how it affects the cost and why we suggested those two areas. Um, uh, yes, sir. 
I can tell you uh, if if you can get out there and obviously in, in off summer months perform this, especially in low tide air, um, seasons um, where you have, you can control the dewatering, uh, to get out there to do say all of Reed Street in one shot, and then and then the northern areas where where we prioritize those there those uh, year one areas. Um, it's it's a lot more cost effective than having to go back and forth. Um, and, and I could probably turn it over to Matt uh, to, to supplement that as far as. Well, I just, I just wanted to, don't want to drag it out, but I want, them to, I want the commissioners to understand what you explained to us the other day that the more times you have to mobilize and demobilize, the higher the cost on, on a stretch of pipe. So. Oh. Absolutely. If you, if you if you can do the work in, in one stretch, say, and not have to break down, leave, and then come back and do and start up again, um, it, it is more cost effective to do it versus uh, you know being interrupted, if you will. Uh, Mobilization is a huge factor on on the relining uh, side of the fence. You know, when you're an excavation company, you're you're mobilizing an excavator unit, you know, a dump truck, and a, and a four or five man crew. With our kind of company, um, we're the relining side, you have a boiler truck, which is a very expensive truck just to mobilize um, the refrigeration unit. You have your TV van and Schwamm truck, which can cut open reinstatements or cut open protrusions. You have your vac truck, you have your pickup truck, and you have a tool truck. So you basically you have like a seven truck fleet driving to a job site with seven, eight guys there at any time to uh, knock this process out. So the longer they're there, you know, is, is the mobilization costs get diminished, number one. And then two, the longer the shots are, the lower the prices can be. So if you have like a 500 foot shot, you know, all of a sudden I can price that up cheaper than I can a 200 foot shot. All right, thank you. Um, per foot uh, I, before Mr. Zelensky, is that the end of your actual presentation? I have like two more slides, Mr. Mayor, if you would indulge me. Yes, and then we'll go to Mr. Stevens and the rest of, so I can see everybody with their hands up. Sounds good. So, so real quick to recap on this slide, if uh, can everybody still see the slides? Uh, yes, the one slide. So, so the Reed Street again, and and getting back to the structure here. This structure here, folks, number thirty-three. If you see in the lower right corner, that's actually that first structure. At, at Coastal Highway going down Reed Street toward the bay. This actually is, if I recall, this is, this is totally packed. This was full. It was so full, we couldn't see the 15 inch RCP that went in the hole in the island of Coastal Highway. We, we, we verified that from the as builts that Jim was able to provide. So the, this number here, on, on the cost estimate, includes clearing that number 33 out and relining from that catch basin that Matt described with the hot resin process all the way down to the new construction at the new junction box at those three new outfalls at the bay and everything crossing the street in between. That's this figure here. This figure on Baird Avenue is all the other purple area. It's Swedes, Baird, down to Salisbury, um, relining that, which we classified as year one the purple area. These are total costs with everything included to do those two areas first. Uh, again, our goals, Mr. Mayor, was identify the priority areas where stormwater infrastructure needs to be inspected, improved, and replaced. We also develop best practices to properly maintain this improved infrastructure in the future. And this will allow the best chance for the town to control potential flooding areas and incorporate these best practices with the existing and proposed construction projects going forward. And that's always been the goal. And with that, I thank you for your time. Mr. Didi, before I go to, uh, before I go to uh, the commissioner, did you have anything further that you wanted to add to this? No, no, sir. I appreciate it. I apologize. I sort of took over here, but uh, time is running by and I wanted to move us on. Uh, could you take down the, the screen display now? 
I can. There we go. Thank you very much. Now I can. Now the dinosaur can see everybody. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you had your hand up. I did, and I, I have. Uh, I have. I have about five questions, but they're very quick answers, Kevin and Matt. So no worries. It's not like an old. Go story. right ahead, sir. Okay. First things uh, on slide eleven, you had section sixty-two, which is technically out of our jurisdiction. Is that an issue? Because that's outside the, the town of Dewey Beach. Um, um, it's part of the infrastructure in the pilot area. Um, I, I'm I'm probably uh, sort of going to defer to to uh, to Jim on that one. Uh, it was again part of the pilot area. We did we did inspect it, we did shoot it, and we did televise it. But the, if that needs to be excluded, we certainly can do that. But it was part of the pilot pilot area. As I understand it, uh, number 46 takes it right to the edge where sea breeze comes in. There's another drain, and that's the item number 62 that comes in, and that's outside of the uh, town's jurisdiction. That's in Sussex County. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess I just want to make sure that we have the right to do this. Right. Uh, on they 60, all connect, on but 66 is right, is right at the property line. Okay. Our, our town. And as, as a matter of fact, Jim, if you recall, when we did a site visit at the beginning of the project, we walked that line, and I believe there was a fence and a gate right there, and that more or less presented the town line, and right, it was right there, sir. So okay. we, we included it. I don't. Um, I'll let the town make that call, but but it, it has been inventory. Well, we would okay. certainly approach the county, Mr. Stevens. Go ahead. Um, the, the second thing is when, uh, Matt, you had talked about the, the guarantee or 50 years, or you said a 50 year life, is that a manufacturer's guarantee on terms of the 50 year life? I don't, I don't think you're going to have anybody, um, warranty anything for 50 years, but, um, it, it is a, you know, kind of like when you put new concrete pipe in the ground, it has a 50 year life. We will warranty something for five years and we can also get the manufacturer to warranty it for five years. But um, I don't think any manufacturer warranties anything for 50 years is, is the problem that we'll, you'll face. And that's okay. whether it's, you know, new pipe in the ground or reline pipe in the ground. Um, and Matt, another question is, and my third, I promise it will be real quick, is the, you had commented on having access and the timing associated with the proposal and the two elements, the proposal for the Reed Street, for example, 153 and the 47, is your proposal based upon the most efficient use of time or is it, or is it based upon the non-efficient use of time? Well, um, our proposal, our, our original prices have been out there now um, per footage price for, since like August. And, you know, there's always just that, you know, every year, you know, there's a little bit of inflation, whether it's 1% or 2%. So I, I, I broke it down and said, okay, well, at this point in time, we may need to revisit it, you know, to reflect that a small inflation rate. If we, if we hold it out till past summer or something like that. I, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not clear. And I just want to be, so if you, if we say go ahead on Reed street and it's 153,000, is that assuming that you've got a clear line? You don't have to go do this section and this section and this section and this section. Is that how the proposal has been developed? I, I know everything that Reed Street needs to be done to it. So I'm fairly comfortable saying if you were to approve Reed Street, that price will be the price to get everything done. The only concern I would have would be the excavation on manhole 33, whereas right now we're not assuming any dewatering. We're assuming we can just dig down a foot or two, you know, and, 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 and put, or, you know, two or three feet and bring that up to place you know, fix it a little bit and put a manhole up on the road and, and pave it. If we have to start dewatering right there and, and stuff like that, you could turn into a seventy-five thousand dollar day. Yeah. Um, we're obviously assuming that you don't need that from what everything that we saw. But, but also, okay. I think I think Mr. Stevens, you're you're also referring to this is this would be one visit, right? Not right. Coming back yeah. and forth. Your cost is one visit. Yeah. But if there is, yeah, okay. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, and two really quick, I have um, my, I, I've always looked at the contracts and looking at what's not being necessarily highlighted. If, is there, is there a chance of failure and maybe Kevin or Matt, you've responded, if there's a chance of failure that this lining doesn't occur or, or is it, it works hundred percent of the time. I guess my concern is that we have go ahead 
and the lining has an issue and it doesn't stick or we can't get through and then we do have to excavate and there's going to be additional cost. So I'm always worried about the unforeseen issues. We've, we've had two failures in five years and those two okay. failures were both on eight inch diameter pipe in, in, and there was VCP or duct, uh, VCP pipe where it was eight inch diameter. And then the reason why they failed is because as we push the liner through with the steam curing, um, you have a lot of pressure. So you have like 30 pounds of pressure on that pipe that burst the pipe open. And as it burst the pipe open, you know, sand and silt and water came in on the sides. And in one of those situations, we were able to just, you know, cut the old material out and replace it with a sectional liner. So it wasn't a big problem. Another situation, it caused an excavation point repair. I can't tell you for a fact that that won't happen, but I would say 99.3% of the time, there should not be any failures, and we've never had a failure on storm sewer or corrugated metal pipe. What happens with that with this contract in the event of failure? That's something I'd have to visit uh, with anybody higher up. I, I don't know if um, you know, the question would become who who's responsible for that. So the the the, the question becomes is what happened? Why did it happen? So there's always a, a case where there's a lack of material on the uh, dirt on the outside of the pipe. If there's no dirt on the outside of the pipe, that's the reason why we had those two failures once upon a time, because <clears throat> the VCP didn't have any pressure holding it together. Mm. It blew apart. So I can't imagine a scenario where there's not sand and silt and dirt, you know, compacted around these pipes that you have, number one. And two, corrugated metal pipe also has a, a bit of a stronger compressive strength than VCP, quite a bit. So I, I really don't anticipate something like that to happen at all. Um, and, and, uh, but, I, but I'd have to talk with somebody else what would happen okay. if that did happen. And, and Mr. Yeah, Stevens, and, and, I, believe, I believe your your smallest diameter pipe in question is a 15 inch. I don't think there's anything smaller. Uh, there, are, there are things we can do to avoid it, which is you, you, we hold the pressure on it all the way through. We could also drag the liner in and then blow it into place those two types of methods reduce that from happening. Um, we, I'm not sure if we were thinking about doing that here, but I can talk to them about doing that here at no extra cost. Okay. Uh, in my last comment, I, yeah, just the last question, I promise. Cause I, Go ahead, I live here. No I, problem. I'm on McKinley. So I know exactly where you are. I know exactly where you're talking about and the issues that we have. Um, one of the, uh, what I was going to ask is, is the, what strategy do you have for the gray area, Kev, Kevin, because, the areas that you cannot see becomes an area becomes an issue or identify. And to me, that's, you know, that that's a potential bigger issue. We may clean some sections, but having not being able to see the certain gray areas. The, it, the, the, the gray area uh, potentially may have to be, be excavated. Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner, I can jump in real quick because I, I've had experience with this uh, working with Kevin, obviously if, if, if those gray areas, there's not a good likelihood that you'll be able to line it. If we couldn't get a camera through there, that means there, there's an obstruction right now, which indicates a structural defect in the pipe. High likelihood you'll have to excavate, or at least portions of it. Well, Christopher, that's, that's, if there's gray areas that, that bookend the areas that's being relined, then the water's not going to flow, right? If, if, I can, if I can jump in, um, the reason why those gray areas exist is because we could not televise them. We couldn't televise them in part because the outfall has been so full of silt at that point in time that it's not gonna drain anymore. But I believe when we started started going in there with shovels to dig it out, people were like, hey, 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 back up. You can't just start shoveling here. This is a wetlands area. So you, you, we kind of hit that situation as well. And we were like, okay, let's hold off okay. from doing any a real work in those spots. And actually, Mr. Stevens, one of the things we, we just this week uh, had the category of the brown area where we could video, but we still, but we could see it um, where we could not really do that in a gray area. So I'm going to, I'm going to say worst case scenario, it's better to prepare for the worst and hope for the best type of thing or, or be delighted if it was better than that. The excavation of the gray areas is the worst case. The brown areas, which is that tweener is, is once it is properly cleaned out, may or may not be a, a candidate for relining. 
we just can't make that call in the gray areas at this time. What, if we just, if you guys hire us to go back out there to do the relining work, I would recommend, uh, you know, one of the superintendents to go over those gray areas with Kevin or somebody like that and show them how we could plan to attack it in the future or what we would recommend to do for you guys in the future. Thank you, gentlemen. Is that all, Mr. Stevens? It is. I apologize for the delay. Like, no, no, that's no problem at all. You covered a lot of good information. Uh, I appreciate it personally. Uh, any other commissioners that have questions? Mr. Jaszewski. Yeah, this is just a, a quick question, which is um, you guys had uh, sent a letter that I think was more of a planning estimate in January to Jim. And it looked like purple and orange then was about $150,000 to do both. And now we're looking at some numbers that are a little bit larger. I'm just kind of wondering what kind of changed to make this project go up in scope or cost. There were two specific changes actually, uh, Mr. Jasinski. Uh, one was um, the first estimate uh, dealt with a single pipe going down uh, Reed Street, whereas in fact, between three of the structures, there's a double pipe. So on further review, we're actually lining two pipes as opposed to one. And the other, and the other uh, uh, hit, if you will, was um, our, our first analysis showed structure 33 to 34 was a gray. Upon the review, we, we were able to review all the video and said, oh no, that is a candidate to be purple. However, 30, structure 33 is, is, is compacted. We need to excavate that out and clear it. So the two areas that, that, that um, uh, and by the way, uh, which, which, which is, accounts for that. And by the way, when we did discover that, I contacted Jim right away, explained it to him, and he understood and said, look, it's better to know now. Than so that's, that's, that, that was, uh, accounts for those two. Uh, okay, that's fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Bauer, did you have your hand up? No, I didn't. Well, sorry about that. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Persinger. Mr. Persinger, sorry about that. You, you were over the corner and I didn't. Me. I saw him waving. Yeah, they, I, they look, I know, Mr. Yeah, they Jizinski, look so much alike. Mr. Krasinski <laughs> says I have it in against him, so I can't have it in against both of you. <laughs> Mr. Persinger, well, go ahead. Yeah, my, my question is really, again, and you touched on this a little bit, the, the other colors that are in the map. We haven't really talked much about the, the excavate and replace dark blue sections. I mean, I... I'm assuming at some point we would want to do that. There's no idea of how much that would cost us. Um, uh, as Commissioner Jasinski just pointed out, the original proposal, I think, included both the purple and the orange, or whatever that particular color is, um, areas. And, and now we're talking just about the purple area. So, you know, we're talking about spending $200,000 now, largely, or perhaps just for these, uh, these purple areas. And then we've got some areas also that are described as needing heavy cleaning. So I'm wondering how we plan for the future here in terms of costs, assuming we undertake these two, uh, these two areas for, um, for relining, I guess is what we're talking about at this point. Well, if I, if I could speak to that, and then I'm gonna ask you to jump in at the end, if I could. Um, the purple areas where, where basically um, they're still in good shape, I should say they're, 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 they're still candidates for relining, but before they get any worse and they're not candidates for relining, uh, we, we need to address those for, uh, right away. The, the uh, orange areas, as you, you described, sir, was uh, they're better than the purple. They're candidates for relining, but they don't have to be right away. That's, if I'm looking at a five-year plan, purple is the first year before they're not candidates. And then years two to five, you can spread out the other orange areas. Yellow, like we said, they're fine. Um, getting back to the blue, uh, which, is, which is in that Northern areas, I'm describing it along Salisbury and, and that small section on Swedes, they're completely collapsed or so compacted, it, 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 they're, they're solid. So, Chris, I'm going to let you speak to that as far as the engineering behind and, and a rough cost estimate to do that work. Yeah, I mean, very simply, it's much cheaper to line a pipe than to open cut the pipe, deal with dewatering, and have to remove and replace the material. Um, when, when there's a window of opportunity to do the lining, we always try to take advantage of it because the pipe's not going to get better in time. It's only going to get worse. Um, if you're open cutting a pipe, 
I mean, you, you, you could be talking one to two hundred dollars a foot, depending on, you know, controlling the water. The biggest challenge of, of working in Sussex County is, is controlling the groundwater, especially when you're in a coastal community. And the, controlling groundwater is a is a large part of the open cut pipe process. So when there is an opportunity to not have to open cut, when we can line, we certainly try to line every opportunity we can. There, there's a tremendous amount of cost savings there. But at some point, we, we have to address these ones that have to be replaced. So. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, at, at some point, I mean, there has to be a prioritization here. Is that, are those areas not particularly high priority for whatever reason, or should we um, be moving them up the priority scale? So, Commissioner, I, I believe that the genesis of this project was to look at this pilot area, come up with recommendations and, and phase approaches to do the construction and, and use this again as, as, as the pilot for, you know, the, the rest of the town. Um, we're more than happy to provide you with cost estimates for the, for the remaining phase of the project. Um, the, it, it all comes down to scheduling and, and looking holistically over, you know, cre creating a five or 10 year plan for how to address these over a period of time from a, from a, from a, a financing and budgetary standpoint. Yeah. And, and, so, and again, again, if I could jump on, on, on that, right now, those two areas are not performing at all. Obviously, because because they're they're they're, they're beyond that. Um, but uh, what, what we wanted to do, uh, talking with uh, with uh, Mr. Devies, um, we wanted to assess, I guess, the best bang for the buck right now. Um, and relining is is that best bang, as Chris Fazio just described. Uh, certainly, uh, again, getting back to forty seven to sorry. <laughs> 47 to 58, which is which is totally uh, which is totally uh, collapsed or or, or uh, compacted, certainly would be a priority, but it's a different priority. That's not a relining candidate. That would be something that I would I would classify as as a different. Approach. Mr. Persinger, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, just one other. The, those areas that are designated, uh, particularly on McKinley Street, designated for for heavy cleaning. Um, you know, what's involved in that? I mean, are we talking about cleaning and then relining? Is that the idea or is there, and what's, what's the cost of a process like that? I think Matt, Matt, those McKinley was, a can, it was either we couldn't access it or we, we accessed it, but, but for whatever reason, not able to, to clean it and dewater it. So those pipes are literally, so they could be candidates. Go ahead. Silt right now. And because they're hundred percent full of silt, you know, it's going to take every bit of three to four days each line segment to clean. Um, you would need a vac out there. You need a, you know, um, and 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 a slow process, just pulling it out and and, and getting all that sand out. The, the concern before was is that we started cleaning it out. We were worried that because there's so much sand there, it probably came from joints, and we we might start pulling more sand in. So you, so we. It wasn't performed mainly because it was 100% compacted. It could, it could be done, but it's several days worth of work. You're, you're looking at probably about a week's worth of work each, each run. So between 31 and 28 is probably three to four days of work, and I guess 30 to 29 is probably a day's worth of work. Um, wasn't there one more? Um. Uh, 30 to 59 out to the outfall, which I don't think you were able to access at all. And, and one of the things we were finding out, Mr. Uh, Persinger, was um, as he was clean, attempting to clean those, it was, it was compromising the integrity around the pipe. And again, getting back to my one slide, it was making it worse, not better. So we, so we determined like, that if off. we're going from catch basin 59, or if you were to find that outfall, we believed we could clean it better. You know, we didn't want to go in from number 30 to try to clean it. We thought that you needed to go in from 59 to clean it. And we, but we couldn't really get access to 59. And that's, that's a big part of the reason why that was held up. You're, you're potentially, you're potentially probably looking at another Reed Street on McKinley. Mr. Mr. First, Mr. First uh, basically, um, the, Biggest bang for the buck were the two purple areas right now. 
and then and then confirming with the commissioners how they wanted to prioritize the rest of the areas. And we had uh, a northern area and a, and a middle or southern area and, and thought that that would uh, also uh, be of interest to the town people that live in, or excuse me, the property owners in the town so that we weren't forgetting any area, weren't trying to just do read and nothing else. But uh, then we would have to prioritize after that the rest of the areas. It's my thought that it would that right now, if you all say that it's uh, we want to go with the idea in general, we would send it to the infrastructure committee, who uh, right now are supposedly watching the program. Uh, we would send it to them for their input, and then come back to us for the final decision on how to schedule and and do the work. Okay. Mr. Mayor, if I could add, uh, we also talked about taking advantage of the new construction at the end of Reed Street that was right. just for those outfalls. We, we, want to, we want to make that nice shiny new all the way out to Coastal Highway and take advantage of that new construction. That was the other thought as well. Mr. Persinger, does that cover everything for you? It does, yes. Thank you. Mr. Jasinski, you had your hand up. Uh, I just had one question for our consultants, which based on what you said, it sounds like if you try to clean some of the uh, gray areas, it's possible that you may end up needing to do an excavation if the cleaning goes sideways. Is that, okay. is that true or no? Because we, of the unknown, that, that would be- So it could, it could basically force us to spend the money basically is what, is what I'm basically right. saying. Yeah, okay. All right, yes. That, that's why I was saying earlier that um, if you guys, um, if we decide to move forward with the relining process, maybe have another meeting on site and looking at these gray areas with a superintendent that says, Hey, if we do this, we feel comfortable. We feel confident we can do We can do a cleaning, you know, or not. And, and uh, go from there before you decide okay. the first one. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to tell the commissioners that once we you know, move this to the infrastructure committee, there's also a possibility that we could, uh, there's financing possibilities that we could do like we did with Bayard Avenue Pump House. We could go to the state sensory fund and then over a, a course of 10 years use the infrastructure fund as payments or we could pay a little as we go and doing the work. There's a lot of different ways we have to discuss. So, uh, it, excuse me, the light just went again. I apologize. <laughs> I don't know how to keep it on. Um, <laughs> I, I would, I would say that um, that we've kind of gone as far as we can go now. Unless any other commissioner has something that they want to ask the questions of the of the Mr. Zelensky, and um, maybe we could just indicate uh, uh, if we want to move forward this project or not. I think Mr. Bauer had his hand up, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Bauer, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do. I have a couple questions. Um, when you guys have done projects like this in the past, is there, you know, my, you know, is there funding that we can get for this from the state, from the county, uh, through Dell Dot? Uh, I'm not sure if there's any, um, you know, if there's any funds out there. Because my big concern is, I mean, I know we need to do this. That's not a question of if we need to do it. It's how do we afford it. That's that's the the bottom Mr. line every day. Mr. Um, Bauer, that's what I mentioned, the one fund, the yeah. century fund that the state has. There, there are others, but it's probably that would be, we'd be hit and miss guessing now what, what was available, what isn't Yeah, no, available. I was asking if, if, you know, if they've done other projects. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Zelensky. Go ahead. So I, I can address that for you. I mean, there, there's, um, DENREC money's available that will pay for engineering studies. There, there's no grants to pay for, um, the, the construction work. There's there's some low interest loans you can apply for, but there's no grants for, for the construction that are readily available from, from DENREC or any of the other agencies. Okay. Um, I know this may sound strange, but I know that sometimes a town looks into giving its storm sewer away, okay? But in order to give your storm sewer away, you have to fix it first. So, let's just say, for example, Dewey Beach didn't want to be responsible for their storm sewer anymore. You could then have Dot take responsibility of it or convince Dot of that 
but then they're going to tell you to fix all of it first. And I think, Jim, we spoke early on in the beginning of the project about, you know, possibly getting assistance from Sussex County. I, I think you and I both don't know if that's an, even an option. Mr. Bauer, does that help? Yeah, yeah that does. Um, now, when we did the engineering study on this, the, you know, the, the camera work, et cetera, were we able to get any grants for that? Do you, do you remember, Jim? No, that was picked up totally by the, by the town. Okay. That, that, yep. That's been paid for and done with. All right. Anything else, Mr. Bauer? No, nope, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. They were good because financing is going to be a big problem, I'm sure. Thanks. Anything else from any other commissioner? Anything else from the town manager, the assistant town manager, Mr. Townsend? No. Well, then I think we've run the course here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate everything. And uh, we certainly, between the town manager and Mr. Didi, please keep in touch with them. We will be back in touch with you. Very good. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. time. We're here. Thank what you, you Chris, Thank Kevin, you Matt, guys. everybody. Thank Have you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you for your time. Now, gentlemen, we're, uh, we're an hour and a half into the meeting. Uh, we're just finished item number one. So we're <laughs> going to an even more controversial item. Item number two, discuss yeah. and possibly vote to approve a draft ordinance to amend <clears throat> chapter 185 zoning of municipal code of town of Dewey Beach, Delaware, 2005 as amended relating to bulk standards in all districts, including but not limited to height, floor area ratio, minimum setback requirement, maximum floor area in multifamily dwellings, basement plantings and open space by amending table two thereof. I, I guess I would like to go if Commissioner Persinger is willing, I would like to go to Commissioner Persinger first on this item since he's done so much work on the comparison chart along with Mr. Jasinski. So go ahead, Mr. Persinger. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what you would like to do. I wasn't planning to go through all of the various provisions. Um, what I'm hopeful that we can do this afternoon is to entertain a motion to uh, approve these changes um, to the code. Um, in terms of the, the, the time between January 8th and, and now, this, this meeting today, um, I've really spent a lot of time working on a couple of provisions mm -hmm. here. Uh, doing a lot of thinking about these provisions and collecting as much information as possible. So I, I would say that I'm generally comfortable with all of the provisions that have been proposed here, except for two. Um, there are two that I would like to see us entertain uh, a change to. First of all, uh, the, the maximum number of stories, uh, and I'll come back to the reasons for this. I Just let me get these out first. I, I believe that um, it is consistent with the emphasis in our comprehensive plan, uh, planning, um, or comprehensive plan rather, uh, to retain the two and a half story provision that's in, in our existing code. So that's, that's one change that I would propose. <clears throat> the second change I would propose uh, is with respect to the uh, setbacks, the side yard setbacks on corner lots. Um, uh, you know, we have had a couple of examples that um, we have, I think, relied on and P&Z has relied on. Um, and the question for me has been, are those examples typical or, or truly representative of the situation in the perhaps 40 or so uh, corner lots that exist in the NR district? Um, I would propose that we take a more cautious approach. And instead of fully reducing the setback to eight feet, I propose we would reduce it to just 12 feet, uh, provide a little additional relief for all property owners, but not go to the full eight feet. And we can come back to a, I can give you, you know, fuller explanation, but that's my proposal. And I would like to offer a, a motion to that, that effect when and if it's appropriate. Mr. Jasinski, you had your hand up? Yeah, but especially since you kind of promised at the beginning that we take public comment, I think it's important before we motion that we invite anybody who's listening to come in and make any additional comments they wanted, since we said that we take additional public comment first. Okay, Mr. Bauer, you had your hand up. 
Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Ashley, do we have anybody in the waiting room? Yes, um, Beth Caruso is in the waiting room and I'm bringing in her iPad as well as her computer because Steve Judge is there to speak with her. Ashley, you said her iPad is what? I'm letting uh, both her and Steve Judge in. They're going to make joint public comment. Stay there. She's connecting now. If you guys, if Beth and Steve, if you guys are in the same room, it's not going to work too well. Yeah, it looks like Beth's iPad and Beth's phone are bouncing off each other. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you fine. The problem that I'm, I was trying to do is actually Steve is having technical problems and we were hoping that the map that you were sent could be put up on the screen. I don't know um, if we can do that. Um, Ashley, do you have a copy of that? I do not have it on this computer that uh, I, I can I can on. send it to you. <laughs> Should I send it to your town email? Uh, Yes, I'll, you'll have to, I'll have to go on pause because I'll have to log into it from a separate. Let me, should I try oh, and see if I can go back in again that way or? Um, if, if you're on, is anyone on their desktop computer where they have access to town? That's what I was on. Yeah. Um, I, I someone, it, someone who has access to it can just share their screen. I'm sorry, we're, you're asking for us to locate the map and put it up on the screen? Well, if somebody could, I mean, I can do it. I can try it from my phone as well. I'm sorry, I thought we'd be able to do it, but it, with the feedback, I didn't realize the sound would feedback. Um, shoot, um, well, I, I guess, I, I hope you guys have had a chance to look at the map and the, and the letter that Steve had sent in. And I'm speaking specifically on his behalf regarding that map. And if anybody, while, while I'm speaking, can put it up, let me know, because um, it would probably make a lot more sense if you're able to see that. Um, hmm. Let me just see one thing. If I got a screen share here, hold on one second. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. I know you have better things to do than watch me try and play around with an <laughs> iPad. Um, but let me just speak to it. And I hope that you guys have, have seen the map. Um, and, and so that, that what I just want to say is this, we have always felt that the expert opinion on these matters of zoning are critical. Uh, with regard to the experts hired, hired by the town, that report stated that building on quarter lots play a prominent role in defining the character of a neighborhood and stated um, that they recommended a 15 foot setback be maintained in that report. We took a look at the town map and have found many unique facets to the, to the mere eight blocks that we're discussing. And that's the map that unfortunately, I guess is not gonna be able to be seen. Oh, there it is, yay, somebody put it up. Yeah, I, I pulled it up here on my phone. Paul, Paul you're a superhero and you, you're good at technology, thank you. Um, but, but with that that's in what mind- young kids so will do to you. <laughs> go ahead, um, Ms. Perita, go ahead. So uh, given my limited time, I'm not going to go through everything that we saw on this map, but I'm just going to point out two things that I think are really significant. First, if you look at the pink line, that's the sidewalk that's currently on King Charles. And should that be extended, it would very much impact the decision to expand the side yard setback. And I know some have said that sidewalks will never be continued. But we simply just don't know that. It's going to, I believe, to be determined at a state level. And maybe it never won't. But if it did, that, that takes 25% of the eight blocks and makes a big difference there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I just want to highlight are the orange circles. And that's very unique. On three of the eight blocks in the NR district, the properties run east-west. 
that's Chesapeake, Cullen, and St. Louis. That would mean that homes built on those corners would have a front yard setback on King Charles and a side yard on Chesapeake, Cullen, and St. Louis. Those properties could build within eight feet of those streets, and I would suggest they would because they would be very likely to see the ocean if they were built that close to the street. So let's just be clear, the side yard would not be King Charles, it would be Chesapeake, Cullen, and St. Louis. I can't imagine anyone would want to see homes built eight feet from those streets. None of those streets have a natural barrier, so there would be almost no separation from the street. It would be a huge unintended consequence of this change. With just these two things mentioned, or that I've mentioned, those are, that's 50% of the NR district on King Charles is an anomaly. I would urge you to keep the side yard at 15, and I would further urge you for those properties where it makes sense, and there are some where it would make sense, have them apply for a variance. Um, as always, I just wanna end by saying thank you guys. You do a tremendous amount of work. I just listened to a, the first hour and a half and my head almost exploded, and I really appreciate <laughs> all of the energy you put into doing these things, and thank you very much. Ashley, is there anybody else? Vincent Thomas. Mr. Thomas, how are you, sir? Oh, he's connecting to audio. Mr. Thomas, how are you? Good, how are you? Sorry, I'm just- Good, go right ahead with your statement. You have three minutes. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, uh, hopefully I, um, I won't get cut off here just given the significant issues at stake for me and, and the amount I've invested in this town. Um, and I, I've heard Mr. Persinger and there seems to be a change of position, which I'm pretty frustrated with on three stories. <clears throat> and um, at times I don't feel like what's going on here has been well thought out. I know that a lot of time has gone into it, but you know, I brought up things, for instance, you know, when the you know, covered porch was put on and how was that going to be calculated, the garage issues and so forth. And I think people should really think about this three stories. Um, I didn't really pay a million dollars for a lot to build a Cape Cod. And I would like, would like to have a garage. And if you just take the setbacks alone, right, there's a 12 foot back setback, 18 foot front setback. That gives you 70, 70 feet um, front to back buildings, building space. And the side setbacks, you have eight feet. So that's 70 by 34 footprint to build. If you maximize that, that gives you 2,300 square feet. So by doing this and, and saying you only get two and a half stories, you're pretty much eliminating a homeowner's ability to do a garage. And if they do, they'll do the garage and then they're going to maximize the second and third floors to the entire building footprint to get to the 4,000. So what you're doing is encouraging people to build to the maximum footprint, as opposed to someone like me that would like to do a 3,500 square foot house and save a backyard, which somebody on Jersey Street mentioned last time. But I can't do that if, if I only have two stories to do it. If I have two stories to get that, I need to build about 2,000 square foot on each story. Now I'm using the whole footprint of my lot, butting right up against my neighbors. So I don't see how that is. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I wonder what, how, how that's been, been thought out. And I just wanted to raise one other point. There was someone on the last call who was on Clayton Street. And he was almost brought to tears because he'd saved his money and <clears throat> wanted to build a beach home, felt that right, rights were being taken away. And one of the responses of one of the commissioners was, well, don't worry about it, it doesn't apply to you. I, and I found that offensive to me because it does apply to me and I'm in the same boat. He's a couple blocks away. And I also saved our money and desired to have a home here, want to build a, a home that a family can use. So I really think 
backpedaling now on the three stories is unfair. It seemed like we had consensus on that. If there is going to be a shift to this, then maybe another meeting can need to be called because I know some folks are not participating because they felt comfortable with where the law is. And I think, you know, that's kind of where I was. I don't really like the 4,000 square feet. I still think it's a substantial taking. I was looking at it from a viewpoint of, you know, considering the, the needs of the other neighbors and their desires, and that's a, you know, 20% taking of property. Uh, but, you know, in exchange, you get the clear three stories and don't have a two and a half stories that's been inconsistently applied uh, through the years. And then just one last thing, I know there was discussion on value and that, you know, taking a thousand square feet doesn't necessarily reduce value. I just think that's false by any metric. One commissioner said, well, if you have no zoning versus zoning, there is a, you know, there's authority to suggest that zoning improves value. Yeah, I would agree with that, but we're not coming from a place of no zoning. We're coming from a place with zoning that's in place and value has clearly significantly appreciated over the last, you know, since the 2000s. And it's, so that zoning seems to have worked and seems to have protected the value. I appreciate people want to move in a little bit different direction, but you should really think about that. I don't see what the harm in the three stories is if you have the rich, uh, the roof pitch, and we have a 35 foot height limitation. It, why force me to build a 35 foot tall building that's going to be two and a half stories and it's going to run the entire building footprint as opposed to one that I can probably save. You know, I have existing plans to go three stories. I'm saving 28 feet on the back of the property. It's going to be green and grass, uh, which I think the neighbors would like. If you put me into a two story only, I'm going to have to use the whole footprint. And I may or may not do, do a garage in that situation. And the garage is very important to us. So I'll, I'll be quiet now. I would hope you consider that and, and certainly consider any shift on the three stories. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. We appreciate your comments. Mr. Jasinski, I believe you had, or Mr. Yeah, Jasinski, uh, then Mr. Stevens. Yeah, so um, uh, I just want to confirm with Ashley that no one else is in the waiting room. Um, there's one more individual. It just says Jim. I don't have a last name, but I'll bring him well, in. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, maybe it makes sense for me to defer until we see if that person is public comment for this. That That's no problem. Ashley, you say there is somebody in the waiting room? Yes, there's one more. In Ashley? Yes. Go ahead, bring him in then. Yeah, it's it's Jim Emmons. Hi, gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Go um, ahead. I've been fortunate. I've I've spoken. What was your last name again, Jim? It's, it's Jim Emmons. Uh, my wife and I own. What was your last name again? Emmons. <laughs> Emmons. E M M O N S. Got it. Okay. We own eighteen Chicago. Thank you and 17 West. Um, I've been fortunate in following Mr. Thomas a couple of times on these calls, and I, uh, I adamantly agree with his sentiment. I thought we were already past the two and a half story thing, and uh, Commissioner Persinger voted for the three, I, I thought, last meeting, and suddenly we're back to the two and a half. Planning and zoning also recommended three versus two and a half. And I don't want to make light of it, right? Every point that Mr. Thomas makes, I adamantly agree with. And I'm just going to add one other point. I honestly think it is irresponsible for a coastal community to make a zoning law that essentially encourages people to build at ground level. I don't think that makes sense. If you go to three stories, you're enabling people, particularly on the ocean block, but anyone in this community who's just a few hundred yards from the ocean to put it on pilings, put a garage underneath and have two stories to build a home. When you do this two and a half story thing, which no one completely understands, I've seen emails with 
pictures of houses that they're calling three stories that I believe were built during the two and a half story requirement. You know, all I'm saying is I want to add the point. It just doesn't make sense for a beach town to create a law that incents or encourages or almost makes people build at ground level. It doesn't make sense to me. And uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that. I am. I almost didn't join as well, as Mr. Thomas said, because I thought we we're past this. Um, I'm not thrilled with some of the changes, but I think that we can live with what's written right now. I don't want to go back to two and a half stories. It wasn't what PNZ um, recommended. We've come up to three stories, back to two and a half twice just in the last four months. Um, I, I just don't understand. <laughs> I just don't understand it. I don't agree with it. I think it should be three stories. And then I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, any, Ashley, anybody else from the waiting room? Looks like Marsha Sheck just joined. Go ahead and log her in. Ms. Sheck, thank you for calling in. You just said you've logged in, so go right ahead. I knew you would miss me if I didn't. <laughs> So, um, gosh, I feel like a broken record. I don't know how long we've been having these calls about the side yard setbacks. Um, you know, there's a lot of us that own properties on side yards. I've always said that I have three, um, full disclosure. I really urge you, if you're going to go from what was discussed at the last meeting, which was more of a... Um, well, three commissioners felt that there was logic and reason to take them down to eight feet and no logic and reason to do anything differently. I think if you're going to change that opinion, and also I just want to backtrack a minute and note that PNZ worked on this for a year and a half and their unanimous vote was unanimously to take it down to eight feet because there was no logic or reason to do anything different. I think if at the 11th hour now in this meeting, we're going from a unanimous vote of P and Z to eight, um, a three commissioner majority of the last meeting to eight, and people probably not participating because they felt like there was such solid ground for eight. I, I think if you're gonna go back up to 12 and remove three feet, you really need to have another meeting to look at some of these. So I'm, looking at what Beth had offered. And I don't really see how that positioning can make sense. So I own the two lots on the corner of Cullen Street. And um, the only reason I could build them east to west is because I own the two lots together. They are already been developed and they are being developed um, east to west front yards, not north to south. So that's not an issue. So Chesapeake Street is out, or uh, Cullen Street is out. On Chesapeake, I'm just texting with the woman that owns the corner lot on Chesapeake who has already applied for a building permit. Her lot is 50 by 90. There's no way she can flip that to build any way but east to west. So I'm, I'm just not, I don't, I'm not understanding that. St. Louis, I haven't looked at, but two of the three examples that were given cannot be built that way. So there is no unintended consequence. Um, and I own two of those lots. Um, Lynn Shoup owns the corner lot on um, Jersey. And, you know, it's just not even logical even if we could possibly build that way because if, we, first of all, I believe our code um, requires you to have your 50 foot frontage on the street side lot that you're titled on. And if we turn the Chesapeake lot, she would not have 50 feet. She would have 50 feet in an alley, in an easement alley. As, so I, don't, I think if you're gonna look at different data that's been brought in at, in the 11th hour, you really need before, I would really ask before you vote that you do further examination of that. This vote is just so important for so many of us and the corner lot owners that have been so vigilant at being in these meetings over the past almost two, two, two and a half years now. And 
we really have provided since PNZ a lot of hard data, factual data. PNZ has reviewed it and agreed with it. They've come out to my lot, particularly where I marked it out for them and we reviewed it. And even if we put in sidewalks, which I don't believe anyone on the North End in this community would um, approve or want, it would drastically change the image of our community. Even if we put them in, we have plenty of room for them. So I, I just wanna say that there's you know, been a lot of consistency with reducing these down to eight to give some justice to the corner lot owners. And um, if you're offering new data at this point that was never presented over two and a half years, I really think you need to take some time to look at it and go out and look at these sites. And um, I welcome anybody out to any of my lots to look at the measurements we've taken. You know, we're will, uh, the corner lot owners are willing to pay for a surveyor to get this right so we can get this right. So we're not here, you know, when we petition you a month from now to review this again. Um, I just really hope that we, you will see that we've presented enough data, we've given the measurements, there's been no logical data to the contrary. And I think it's just, although I totally respect the professional engineers, um, I really, ha having the number of houses I have in the North End and having lived here for 15 years, cannot see how reducing this to the eight feet will change the effect or character of our community. And you know me, I'm big on character of the community. So I just really hope that you'll give that some consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, Ashley, is the time up? It is, yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shek, I appreciate your comment. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Jasinski, we're back to you. And then I believe Mr. Stevens was after Mr. Jasinski. Anna okay. joined as well for public Whoops. comment. So, Dale, should we continue public comment until we're done with people? Excuse me. Ashley, is there somebody in public comment? Anna, Anna Legates just joined as well. Excuse me? Anna Legates just joined oh. for public comment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gates, thank you. Oh, you're connecting. We can see you, but we can't hear you yet, Anna. She's connecting. I think she gets the same thing. I, I, there we I, go, Ms. Legate, thank you for coming in. Yes, um, I almost didn't check on the meeting because when I read the uh, agenda and saw the table, I assumed that you had pretty much formed a consensus at the last meeting, especially with the three stories. Oh. Go ahead, Ms. Legate, go ahead. No. Can you hear me? We're yeah, hearing you. Okay. Hang on, I'm going, I'm going down to another floor. You're fine as we, you are. We can hear you, Anna. We can hear you, Anna. Okay. Uh, anyway, I thought you had kind of formed a consensus and agreed, and so I wasn't going to um, log in, and then I decided the last minute to just check on it, and I, my biggest concern is this three stories versus two and a half stories. Uh, I built two homes in Dewey. I owned in the NR and the RR, and I totally agree with Jim Emmons. It is really crazy to not allow three stories when we are this close to the beach. Uh, it's, uh, if you work with an architect, you have a lot more flexibility, it's safer. Uh, we put in, when we built our house on West Street, we put in breakaway walls on the first floor because of water issues, you, we just don't know. So the three stories I thought was a done deal and I really think it's crazy to vote today when I think a lot of people looked at the website and maybe agreed with the table that you published on the website. So I don't know. I'm just really, uh, really concerned at the direction this meeting is taking. On the corner lots, my parents owned a property in Rehoboth, in South Rehoboth, on the corner, and the setbacks were more narrow than Dewey, and they're, we live in a beautiful neighborhood. So I don't know. I just think that people uh, had 
felt pretty good after the last meeting and now things seem to have turned upside down. Is that all, Ms. Gate? Le Gate? Yes. Thank you very much for your comment. You, You've been around a long while. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Ms. Ashley, did anybody else in the... Not at this time, that is everyone. Okay, then I'll cut off the public comment right now and go to Mr. Jasinski and then Mr. Stevens. Okay, so uh, in order for us to discuss this, what I'd like to do right now is make a motion. And I'd like to motion that we approve the proposed zoning, the proposed zoning ordinance of chapter 185 with the following changes. In section one, in the two places where it says maximum, maximum number of stories, three, that that be changed to maximum number of stories, two and a half. And in section two, in the two places showing the numeral eight, referring to setbacks, that it be changed to numeral 12. And that's the end of this motion and I'm making it so that we can discuss these two items that are controversial. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second so that we can discuss? I'll second. It's second by Mr. Persinger, motion by Mr. Jasinski, second by Mr. Persinger. We're now open for discussion. Mr. Stevens, you were next. Yeah, I look, we've been back and forth on these issues. We hire people, we ask people to sit on committees to give us their opinions. Uh, we need to take that. We've heard now this, this, the conversations around this have been long and we should be smart enough to figure this out. And uh, I can tell you that uh, going less than three stories is, is, is it's, a, it's a bait and switch and I will not support it. Is that all, all Mr. Steve? Yeah, that's all right now, Dale, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. M Mr. Bauer, I believe you had your hand up. I, d I do. Um, got a question on, on that section two that uh, David put in the motion. What, is, what does that make the setback? It makes the corner lot setback 12 instead of it's currently 15. Okay. So it gives, it gives them some relief, but not everything they want. So anything, anything else, Mr. Barrow? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my two cents worth in on this thing. Um, you know, it's in the spirit of fairness. You know, you know, I'm trying to balance what I think people want in the north end of town is they, they want to restrict how big things get, correct? So two and a half, when you shorten your top floor, your bottom floors feel they become wider, right? You're going to get 4,000 square foot out of it either way. When you move setback back, that means you're going to make that house skinnier and taller. Um, you know, this is just a game we're playing with numbers on this thing. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, are we infringing on people's property rights? And I'll give you an example. If I'm a lawyer, I'm going to say, well, you made the corner setbacks 12, but you let the people, the next door neighbors on each side of them do eight. Why did you do that? Why didn't you make them all 12? Why did you make it eight? And, you know, we have to be consistent. So do we want to make it, can we, do we want to change the ordinance that everybody has a 12 foot setback or 20 foot set, but we can make it any number you want. However, we just need to be fair across the board. I, you know, I understand if I, you know, I don't own any of these lots, but if I had a corner lot, I don't like having a bigger setback than my next door neighbor on each side. Um, that, I, that doesn't sit well with me from a fairness level. Uh, you know, whatever number we come up with, don't just try to attack the corner lot owner if you're not going to change it for everybody. Uh, I think that's the first part of it. And I'm still uncomfortable taking 5,000 down to 4,000. And now we're going to squeeze that top floor and that's going to make the house wider. And then at that point, uh, you know, at that point, people are losing their backyards. And I think, you know, we, we did hear that this, in the spirit of what people want in that north end of the neighborhood is, is that outdoor space. Um, so are we trying to get rid of backyards and garages? I don't think we are, but we're sort of, you know, <laughs> that, that's, what, that, that's the cause and effect that we're creating here. So that's my two cents worth in. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm willing to compromise on some of the square footage and setback stuff, but, um, you know, at some point we're, we're, we're treading on, on, on in an area that people are, are going to be so unhappy with it that they're going to come back after us for us. And, you know, you can mark my words on that thing. Any other comments? Mr. Persinger? Yeah, since I created the controversy, I'll um, try to chime <laughs> in here. 
Um, with respect to the setbacks, first of all, currently those corner lot owners are, are subject to 15 feet. So the proposal here is to actually give them some relief. We're not being unfair to them. We're actually giving them some additional room that they can, uh, can expand to, expand their footprint to. So I don't think that's, that's unfair at all. Um, the question is, you know, we were presented with some examples of corner lot situations. Uh, Marsha Schick offered one, um, and, and these same examples were offered to P&Z. The question is, do those examples, uh, are they typical of corner lots generally? Uh, are they representative of corner lots generally? I mean, I, I think we have to treat uh, all of those owners the same way. And when I look at, when I did some additional research um, and I asked the town to provide some examples, what I see is that there is a difference um, in the, I think, well, let me back up a second. The, the um, measurements that we were looking at, particularly on um, Marsha Schick's property was from the edge of the travel lane to the property line. Um, when I look at that same measurement for other corner lots, I see some variations. Um, and in fact, generally, it seems like the lots on the ocean side of King Charles are narrower, that, that dimension is narrower than, than it is on the, uh, it would be the, uh, the uh, east side, or west side rather, of King Charles. So, um, you know, it's possible to construct something that would handle that variation, but, you know, in doing so, we would have to treat property owners in a different way, each property owner in a different way to handle that variation. There is the complication of the lots that face that where the longest dimension is east-west. Um, I don't know the specific situation for each of those lots, but um, you know, if there is a chance that, that the, the front of that lot could face King Charles, uh, then you would have the potential situation where you would have um, a the side yard for uh, a building that was erected on that lot to be much closer to, to the surface of the street uh, than we experience right now. Um, so, you know, having said that, um, you know, and I, I recognize in, in some sense that this is when I began to compare some of those, those uh, dimensions on the east side versus the west side of King Charles, that's in essence new information. But it's information that I felt like I had to dig into because no one else was coming up with any uh, strong examples uh, that either supported the two examples that we have or, or refuted those, those same examples. So I, I believe that, that the information I found um, made me believe that we should adopt a more conservative approach in changing the setbacks. Yes, provide some relief, but do so only at 12 feet so that we could uh, have a better um, uh, sense that we're gonna preserve, preserve the kinds of uh, viewing lanes that we have down, down King Charles and uh, Baird Avenue as well. Those are the two streets that are mainly primarily affected. Um, and then with respect to the two and a half stories versus three stories, um, there is no reason why with a two and a half story limit, at least that I'm aware of, that you can't raise your house on pilings, include a 500 square foot garage, and then build two full stories on top of that. I don't believe that that first level that includes only a garage would be counted as a full story. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a problem. I, I think you can build those two full stories on top of that. It's going to look very much like a, a full three-story building. And that's part of the reason why I uh, was provided some support for the three stories versus the two and a half. Um, but that also, if you go to three stories, that virtually guarantees you're going to have three-story uh, buildings there. Everything's going to look like uh, three stories. Um, and you, uh, someone who is not um, building uh, who's going to preserve the existing property that's there could be faced with a uh, three-story wall on both sides. Um, the other th thought that I have with respect to the two and a half versus three stories, two and a half is already part of the current code. Um, and I think part of our charge as commissioners in terms of the comprehensive plan, and this is part of the implementation of the comprehensive plan, is to identify and, and define the character of those residential communities within each zoning district and ensure zoning and other municipal code uh, will encourage architecturally interesting design options 
while preserving those elements of the built environment that support the existing sense of community. I think that, that retaining the two and a half stories is entirely consistent with that. Uh, it asks us to define the, the character of the residential communities. I think that's a, intended at least to be a defining characteristic of those, char those communities or that in our community. Um, and you know, it's not our, our duty obligation uh, to, to change the character. One other point I would make, there has been some uh, reference to the uh, study that was done by Remington Vernick um, that was uh, used to assist PNZ in developing their recommendations. Um, what they said in their report was that tiered setbacks and the two and a half stories essentially accomplished the same purpose. There was no recommendation that we eliminate both of those. I think there was a clear implication that we, we could retain or should retain at least one of those. Um, and I, in this, this case, I would favor the two and a half stories. So I thank you, Mr. Mayor, that, that ends my comments. Mr. Jasinski, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, explain why I did the motion uh, in the first place this way. Um, zoning issues are about compromise. And uh, there are clearly some people uh, who, for whatever reason they have, they, they want to build a house a certain way. Um, and there are other people who like the neighborhood the way it is. Um, what a lot of people watching live don't see is all the people who take the time to write in, but don't necessarily take the time to sit through one of these meetings. And they're quite numerous. And uh, for the people who live in the North End, uh, there's a predominant feeling that they want to try to preserve the integrity uh, and the sense of community of the neighborhood as the comprehensive plan dictates. So compromise is about balancing those two issues. Um, right now you can't build three stories. Uh, you can only build two and a half. Uh, it took us quite a while to get to a proper two and a half uh, legislation. It took quite a number of years. Um, we need to give this a chance to work. The impact on a neighbor who enjoys their lower level porch, garden or backyard of a full three story house is very significant if you're in a one story house and there's a full three story house towering next to you. Regarding the corner lot setbacks, I, I, I'd like to thank Mr. Judge and Ms. Caruso for putting some facts that take the entire community um, into account and really describe how everything is they did. They clearly put uh, considerable time into it and they really showed how it could be quite problematic, not just for one or two lots, but numerous lots in the neighborhood. Uh, the 12 feet is to give some people relief on their, uh, on their footprint of their home. I understand that people with corner lots are concerned about it. Uh, one of the callers today she said she, that she needs an additional two feet. Uh, this will give her, you know, an additional three feet. So it, it does help some people. So this is about compromise, and that's why um, uh, I've made the motion to do it this way. Is there any other comment from any of the commissioners? Mr. Persinger. Mr. Persinger, your mic. I was trying to keep my dog out of the conversation. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned the, the, what, I, what I believe what, and what I see in the, in the information available to me, that the difference in um, uh, the corner lots on the, on the ocean side versus those who are on the other side of King Charles. I found a difference that's as much as six feet. Um, and so we're talking about lowering the uh, the setback from by, by a total of seven feet from from uh, fifteen to eight, when there seems to be a difference already of six feet. Um, you know, I, I think you know we need to be conservative here. Um, I, I think that kind of difference argues for for being conservative. Uh, and again, that's that's why I have come to the conclusion that is better to settle on twelve feet rather than going to the full eight feet. Thank you, Mr. Persner. Is that all? That's all. Mr. Stevens, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want, you know, we you know, we're obviously dancing around with a few different issues. Um, and, and I'd like to, you know, first of all, the Commissioner Jasinski and Commis Commissioner Persinger, I know you guys put a lot of time into this. And I, I can't help but be leaning in a few different directions. One is uh, we asked the Planning and Zoning Commission to put together this study. They spent a significant amount of time and quite frankly, I, I, I want to respect some of the decisions they made based upon what we asked them to do. And um, it, it, it's, I don't think we're doing our job completely if we're just ignoring what they said on the setbacks. 
The, the second is there's an, there's an issue of infringement upon people's rights. We've heard that. And uh, Commissioner Jasinski, I, I agree with you. My inbox is filled with opinions on this, this topic, whether it's two and a half, three, whether it's eight versus 12, whether it's 5,000 or 4,000, which is based upon you know, those people who really care. And it's almost, we're in a, uh, I'd like to say we're in almost a no-win situation, which those who haven't already made the changes to their home under the prior code. That there, there's not a single road on the North District that doesn't have a version of a house that we're trying to stop from happening. So there's no preservation of a certain street or community feel. There, there are bigger homes on every street. Now, if there were all the cottages, maybe I, I can see your points here. But I, I, I think it's a disrespectful to the, the planning and zoning. And I, I think we're, we're opening our, up ourselves up for liability by infringing upon our residents' rights to what they want to do in this town. So that's my, only com my final comment until. Thank you. Is there course. any other comments from any commissioner? Well, then I'll give yeah. my comment. I, uh, go ahead, Dale. I have a comment, but go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Bauer. I didn't see you. No, it, it, we haven't asked Fred to weigh in on this thing yet. Uh, Fred, you know, I know we've, you know, a couple people had mentioned when they called in as they thought we had come to some consensus prior to coming into this meeting. Are we in good shape legally doing this the way we're doing it? Uh, or is there some, you know, obviously we have to consider the legal consequence of our actions as well. Uh, Fred, do you feel that we're in a defensible position? Well, um, I understand the sentiment. However, uh, I think that these sections and the possible amendment of them um, is very much uh, up for grabs during the course of a meeting that's been duly noticed and that you can't assume based on a prior conversation, even if there was something of a consensus in a, in a motion that 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 item is now off the table when it comes time to actually vote on uh, enactment of the ordinance. So um, again, I, I understand the sentiment, but I think legally it's, you're not prohibited from reducing the, or increasing the side yard setback to something other than what was uh, discussed and perhaps even um, uh, the subject of a motion yep. from, from, a, uh, from an eight foot setback, for instance. Are, Fred, are you comfortable with the fight, you know, the taking the current zoning of 5,000 down to 4,000? Yeah. Well, well that, that's an unfair statement, Mr. Bauer. <laughs> is he comfortable just, with I'm it? I'm asking a question. It's not a statement at now, all. I'm, I'm asking you to, what is your question other than is it from, is, are you no, comfortable? No, I mean, is, is, is Fred it, comfortable? If you, if you ask him, is it legal? Is it proper? Is it within yes. bounds, then that's all right, but not yes. is, it in, is it in bounds, Fred? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I, I, I would speak up if I thought that you were, um, you know, zoning law is essentially restricting people's property rights. So we're, we're not, this is not entirely new territory. We have zoning in the, in the uh, town already. So it's not, it's not fair to say that we are um, uh, necessarily unduly restricting people's or taking people's property rights as a result of implementing a, a area restriction like that. Um, there is some, there is, there, there's some point where an appraiser perhaps, uh, some kind of expert testimony could establish that you have rendered a property undevelopable, um, violated some standard like that, which might trigger a, a legal action that we couldn't successfully defend. But uh, by my estimation, we're not near that point. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Bauer, it. go ahead. Mr. Bauer, anyway, anything else? No, no, that was my question to Fred. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Mr. Person, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I just, um, you know, the comment about that, that we're really ignoring the recommendations of, of PNZ. I mean, I, I don't think we are. PNZ has given us some advice. Um, and, and while we're, we're not going along with their recommendation to 
uh, move the side yard setbacks to eight feet or to go to three stories. We also have made um, a lot more uh, liberal, I think, uh, changes here. Uh, if you'll recall, the original recommendation from, from P&Z was that the um, uh, maximum building size was going to be 4,000 square feet uh, for all areas above grade and under roof. Um, we've certainly clarified that. We, we have uh, taken porches that are under roof out of the calculation. Um, you know, we've made some additional clarifications uh, with respect to basements and uh, we've included the maximum number of bedrooms where there, there were not, had not been included by B and Z. So I, I don't think we've ignored their advice at all. I mean, we certainly have, have made changes, some of which have been more flexible in terms of a property owner, uh, some of which have been more restrictive. Um, but, you know, that's, I think that's a part of the process. Anything else, Mr. Persinger? That's all. Is there anything else from any other commissioners before I go ahead and make my comments? Okay. Um, I think- Mr. Mayor. Excuse me? Mr. Mayor, the Fred had his, ta had his hand up. I didn't want to- Oh, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Townsend. I don't want to add another layer of uh, controversy to this unnecessarily, but you did get a, a suggestion that I don't think we had uh, heard uh, during any of the previous meetings uh, from a caller who called in and spoke during the original public comment session about taking the provisions that relax the um, zoning code with respect to setbacks and making them effective immediately and delaying the effectiveness of those that are more restrictive to give people an opportunity to, to come forward before the area restriction goes, in, goes into place. I think that is doable. So if the group wants to consider that either, either as part of this motion or another motion. They, Mr. They, Townsend, is it possible then that, uh, that we could take a vote as on what we've been proposed already mm -hmm. and then another vote on implementation of what is or is not passed? Yes, it is possible. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, then I'm gonna cut off debate here and give my final comments mm -hmm. and then ask for someone to call the question. Um, number one, two and a half stories is existing code. I don't think there's any um, way we can say that we're, someone can say that we're hurting or taking away the rights of uh, present homeowners by staying with two and a half stories. It's still the same height limit. It's again, just two and a half stories. And it's not something that was very confusing when, when you sat down and read the code and saw the diagram, the, in my opinion, the two and a half story was very doable and it keeps the code as is. Uh, yard setbacks, I understand why people were, people who particularly owned the corner lots wanted a change down to eight feet. I think personally, I think 15 feet was, was fine with the setback as is, but I was willing to compromise on behalf of the property owner down to 12 feet. Uh, I think somebody mentioned that the possibility of a sidewalk on King Charles, I think people say, oh, that's, that'll never happen. Well, they said they would never have houses in the North End before it was the North End when it was all woods. They said there was no chance that it would change from existing houses to the houses that are there now, but th there is a chance and I think I think that's a very good possibility and could very well be done by the state or the town. Um, I, they, there's been comment about lawsuits. I think uh, lawsuits are always possible. This is a very litigious society. Everybody's got enough money to get a lawyer can file a lawsuit. And if you don't, you, there's enough uh, um, groups that will back uh, somebody who is poor enough that warrants their help. So lawsuits, I'm not worried about. I think we're doing, I think what the commissioners are doing, they're trying to do for the benefit of Dewey Beach, whether you agree or disagree with the cha possible changes. I think the character of the community consistently changes. Uh, I think keeping as much, for instance, two and a half story of the existing code and as much setback on the side streets as possible is good for the community. And I think it tries to keep the character of the community. You know, 
personally, I think change is all right. Like I said earlier, people never, never thought there would be Dewey would be the way it is now. They always thought it would be the stepchild of some other city or town. And, and obviously we're not, we're changing. And most of the people that contacted me over the last three weeks of this have said that they didn't want any change. Some of them said they didn't want a higher houses and didn't understand that the height limit was not being changed. Somebody said they didn't want, uh, 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 some of them said they didn't want uh, the trees to be cut down. And I agree with that. The wider house would threaten more and more, the footprint of the house would threaten more and more trees. And it would threaten the open area in the, in the beach area. And I, I think Dewey's North End is very noted for its openness. I think they said we're running against PNZ, the wishes of PNZ, and I don't think so. I think that you've seen two, excuse me, at least two PNZ members express their thoughts on changes from what was recommended. And I think we've encouraged enough people for the last probably two years, Fred, maybe it's been two and a half years that we, since we started this. Uh, but um, I think we've asked for enough advice and we've, we've wrung the, the, the water out of the, uh, out of the uh, rag here and, and it, we just can't go on any further. I think now is the time to take a vote. So uh, I would entertain a motion to call the question. Motion. Uh, call the question by the person who made the original motion. Fred, is that the right thing to do? Call the question now. Um, you can call the question as the chair, or someone can ask you to call the question. Uh, I, we've both done it then. That's mm -hmm. okay. So I, I, I would like to ask, though, that we've got this ordinance in front of us. And just to make sure I know and everyone knows what we're voting on. We've what? Fred, go ahead and say that again. I'm sorry. We, we have a number of things in front of us. Some of them are showing markups. Um, and we've got this ordinance that doesn't show any markups and the motion as i understand it and i want to make sure we all understand it is with regard to section two it's substituting the numeral 12 instead of eight that's the motion there, yeah, there are two, yeah that is that is correct it's in two place the numeral uh uh we're substituting the numeral eight for the numeral 12 fred and it's in two places in that section Numeral 12, 4, 8, you mean? No, numeral, we're taking numeral 8 out and replacing it with 12. Right. Okay. Well, okay. So eight's in, eight's in the code, but the ordinance is being, right. um, what we're going forward with is an ordinance that is substituting the numeral 12 for the, for the one that was posted that said <laughs> eight. That's correct. Is that right. Right? Let me be, let me be, let me be clear what I'm doing this off of, what I did the, the motion off of here. Um, you had a, a document was posted, proposed zoning changes, no markup.pdf. My, my, my motion is against that document so that the markups aren't confusing to the motion. Okay, so section two, we're going with 12. Section three, it, is that being changed? Let me go back to what I motioned. So uh, no, we're changing sections two and section one was the motion. Um, section three is not changing. Okay. Section three is zone RB3. All right, and the section one where it refers to three would, would just simply restate two and a half if the motion were to pass. That is correct, where it says maximum number of stories three, that will be changed to maximum number of stories two and a half. Mm -hmm. And in section one, that is stated in two different places. Very good. Fred, are you finished? I am, thank um, you. Well, then the question has been called. Uh, I will go uh, read off as I see people on the on the screen and uh, Fred, is there any particular way other than the roll call that you would like people to answer? 
Um, no, roll call is the appropriate way. It's a zoning ordinance, and I would ask the the members to do as they have been doing, which is provide support for their positions. All right. Well, then I will make I will uh, start off the roll call. This is Dale Cook, the Mayor, Commissioner, of Town of Dewey Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, for reasons that I just previously stated, uh, that. I believe two and a half feet, two and a half stories existing is fine with me. And I'm willing to compromise from the 15 feet to a 12 foot side setback. I would have rather have stayed with the 15 feet, but I think for in order in spirit of compromise for the benefit of the homeowner, I would uh, go to 12 feet. And uh, the rest of it is uh, rest of the ordinance is fine with me. Uh, I vote yes on the motion. Uh, Mr. Jasinski. Uh, Mr. Jasinski also votes yes on the motion for two reasons. One is uh, the revisions are consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, and number two is based on the uh, voluminous public input we've received over this two year process. I believe the motion most closely aligns with the greatest number of people's desires. Thank you. Commissioner Bauer. Yeah, I'm gonna vote against it uh, only from the standpoint of I think we're going a little bit too far. Um, and that's just my, that, that's my personal opinion of you know, what I've weighed from everybody. Uh, I, I think we've done a lot of good things with it, uh, but I do think we're going just slightly too far, but that's my, I'd, I'd be a no vote. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Steve, I'm sorry, Commissioner Persinger. Hmm. Your mic, Commissioner Perkinger. Sorry, um, I will vote aye on this motion. Um, and my reasoning is uh, I believe that two and a half stories is intended to be a part of the character of the town, uh, of the, uh, excuse me, of the NR district. Uh, and it is part of the current code. Um, I uh, believe there's enough variation uh, among the various corner lots throughout the NR district that it makes sense to take a conservative approach to providing some relief on the side yard setback for those, those uh, corner lot owners. Um, and I think that uh, conservative approach is better served by going to 12, 12 feet than it is going to eight feet. That all, sir? That's all. Yeah. Mr. Steven. Uh, I'm voting opposed. I believe that what we had presented and put on our website was a fair representation of what we should have done. And I think these last minute changes is not consistent with what we have discussed in the past. So I'm adamantly opposed. So the motion as I see it passes three to two with myself, Commissioner Jasinski and Commissioner Persinger voting in favor and Commissioner Bauer and Commissioner Stevens voting against. Um, we've been on for two and a half hours. Uh, would, would you care to take a break for a short period of time? Commissioner? Yeah, I'd be good with that. That's Mr. fine. Passenger, Commissioner Jasinski, Commissioner Stevens. Yes, yeah, how fine. much longer do you think we're going to go today, Dale? Let's, let's take five minutes at the most. Is that all right? Yes. 2.35. Two Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
No, that's okay. I'll, I'll get it out. Mm -hmm. I was going to come and try to work on your light. See if I can get it to work for you. I can't get it to stay on. That's what I was going to try to. There's no switch to. That's what I was going to try to do. See, that's a manual switch, I think, right there. I tried that. Oh, you did? Yeah. Last time it just started going off again. As a matter of fact, Kate also tried it. Okay. All right. Well. <laughs> uh -oh.
Well, we're almost there, folks. As soon as everybody comes back on, we'll be. Just waiting for, uh, waiting for Commissioner Stevens to fist log in and Mr. Bauer to log in. I'm here. Okay, Mr. Bauer. Now we're, we've got one, two, three, four, five commissioners online. Uh, Mr. Townsend is about to log on, I guess. And Mr. Persinger, your mic is still off. Everybody. Hey, uh, Mr. Townsend. Quick so now we have to talk about the implementation. Is that the next phase of this discussion? Yes, sir. That is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. I appreciate that. Well, I see your picture, Mr. Bauer, but I don't see you. I'm here. I was just trying to recharge my phone. It was starting to go dead, so I put the. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to, to ignore my phone. It's been bleeping. I'm doing this on the phones. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got one, two, three, four, five commissioners here. Mr. Stevens, how are you doing this, this afternoon? Doing great, Mr. Mayor. Thank looks you. Looks like you're in uh, deep thought. Always. Always. All right, gentlemen, at... Uh, at the suggestion, I believe, originally of Mr. Townsend about uh, how we can, how we can um, talk about the date of implementation of the new zoning regulations that we just passed, or the changed zoning regulations we just passed. Um, Mr. Townsend, would you take your mic off? There you go. Thank you. And possibly explain to me and the rest of the commissioners what the what the range of possibilities are that would be reasonable for changes of zoning, implementation of changes. Well, if we're if we're still on the ordinance, um, section 10 indicates that the ordinance that you've just enacted takes effect 180 days after its adoption. Yes, sir, I read that. So I believe you you could accept out um, the provisions of section two um, and make them effective uh, immediately and leave the provisions, the remaining provisions in effect or the effective date for the remaining provisions to be 180 days. And there may be other examples that you want to draw a distinction for, but I think it was Ms. Shoup who raised the issue of section two being made effective immediately. As of right now, as of if we stopped right now what we posted, we would be accepting 180 days for implementation of everything. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, that doesn't seem to be what the commissioners are interested in. I saw, I saw Mr. Bauer, Mr. Persinger, and Mr. Stevens, so we'll go in that mm -hmm. order. Mr. Bauer. Yeah, a um, couple things. So I forget who it was. Was it uh, somebody had called in? I took notes on this, but they had mentioned a little longer than that. So they said, you know, nine would be better, you know, nine or 12 would be better than six. Um, I'm in agreement of that, uh, you know, and we can, I can make that in the form of a motion if we need to, but we need to, um, you know, I guess there's parts of it where, you know, that we've relaxed some things and I think we ought to be able to do those right away. You know, the, the 15 to 12, I don't think we should wait six months or nine months to enact that. Uh, I don't think anybody, well, I don't know, we can leave that up for discussion, but, um, <laughs> but but the more where we're, where we're being more restrictive, give people an opportunity to build whatever they're going to build during that period of time. Mr. Persinger, you were next. Yeah, I, I'm in favor of um, making those those provisions that are um, you know less restrictive to, to be effective immediately. Um, but what I would like to do is is perhaps take some time to, to make sure what those provisions might be. We might miss some of them. 
And maybe if we good, did a good review and come back with a recommendation and vote on that next month, I didn't get a sense that it was time critical over the next 30 days for people to have a sense of that. I'd rather you know, feel like we've had a little bit of time to make sure that we include all of the provisions. And um, with respect to Commissioner Bauer's suggestion, I, and I, I'm not sure how we would handle that. We just passed an ordinance in which uh, it says the, it will take effect within 180 days. I mean, do we have the, uh, I mean, do we have the ability to, to, to change that at this point? Um, I'm not sure what the process should be. If, if in fact there was a general feeling that we should provide more than 180 days for some of these provisions. All right, uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, Mr. Townsend has his hand up. I want to go to Mr. Townsend first and then you, if that's all right. Of course. Thank you. So in response to that question, and it's a good one. And what I was thinking was you, you could, you could move to reopen for the purpose of amending section 10. Um, of the ordinance. So it would be a motion to reopen the, the, um, the matter that was considered under um, item number two on your agenda for the purpose of amending section 10. That would be the way to do it. So I think okay. you would probably have to move to reopen and then take a second motion um, on what the amendment would be. Okay, Mr. Stevens, your comments? I guess it's the same exact thing. We're, we're, we, didn't we just finish a 40 minute conversation on how to amend what was proposed? And so now we're gonna have another motion to open what we just, uh, what a majority of the commissioners just agreed to. It just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. All right. In, in other words, you're, not, you're asking that we not change 180 days. I'm asking from protocol. I'm not saying I disagree or agree with 180 days. I thought we just spent 40 minutes talking about changes to the ordinance. We, we did spend a long time talking about changes to the ordinance, but we did talk earlier about that we could possibly change the implementation date when we questioned But that it. was not proposed in the prior motion. Mm -hmm. That's and true. By, and then three of the commissioners agreed to accept these changes as it was proposed. I, I, I agree with you, sir. Mr. Bauer, you had your hand up again. Yeah, I was going to just motion to uh, discuss oh, specific section 10. I'll make a motion to uh, change to amend chapter 10 of this ordinance. Section 10 of the ordinance you're talking about. Correct. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about. I'll make that motion to amend that section and well, uh, open there, it up for discussion. Is there a second for that motion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, the motion fails. Mr. Townsend. You have your hand up. Oh, I was just going to assist if the motion passed and ask that it be clarified that it's a motion to reopen, but the motion didn't. Mr. Okay, Mr. Dudzinski, you had your hand up and then Mr. Stevens. Yeah, so, you know, to Commissioner uh, Persinger's point, sometimes things, if you do them too quick, have unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I get what the one person said about they want to have the relaxed side yard setbacks. All of these different provisions in the zoning that are proposed to be changed, they're all interconnected. So if you allow a single relaxed element like side yard setbacks, but then they still have, say the lot's 50 by 100 and they have a 5,000 square foot limitation, then they're closer to the street with 5,000 feet and that may not be what people attended. So we just need to be really careful about um, trying to kind of mix the new code with the old code at the same time. And the suggestion I would have if we want to allow people a little bit more flexibility and our town solicitor should say what this is possible is whether we allow an individual property owner for their own property to elect within the 180 day period to have all of these changes applicable to their own property. So in other words, they accelerate all of the changes specific to their property rather than having to wait the 180 days. That way, everything is together as it was intended. Well, I just to comment, I happen to agree with Mr. Stevens. We just spent a long time arguing about this and the, what we passed, passed with 180 days. Mr. Stevens, your comment. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay right now. I'll withhold from any comment. Any other comments from the commissioner? Yeah. I mean, Mr. we did Mr. say in that meeting that- Hold, the, hold on one second, Mr. Bauer. Mr. Persinger was gonna say something first and then Mr. Bauer. Well, my, my, my comment is really not well-formed at this point. I, I'm really confused about the process. I mean, I, I think 
with respect to provisions which may be less less restrictive, I was sort of taking uh, off of the guidance that we had probably now, now uh, an hour ago from, from our town solicitor that we could consider some sort of a motion that would allow an individual to um, have some relief in terms of some of these provisions that would be less restrictive. Not relief, but would have the ability to take advantage of some of the less restrictive provisions. Is it possible this could be something that we could consider as um, letting an individual homeowner apply for um, uh, without any appeal fee uh, and applying perhaps to the Board of Adjustment? Is that, would that be a proper procedure? And directing that at, at Fred. Mm -hmm. Mr. Townsend, your comment? Uh, well, certainly, um, the, that's that's not that's not improper, and I think that under certain circumstances, it would be the fees associated with an application for a variance. So, um, in in this case, the applicant would say that the uh, town has considered. Um, uh, reducing that restriction or relaxing that restriction, and they'd, they'd like that to be implemented on their on their property, and the board of adjustment could consider granting that relief. So that would be a totally appropriate way to proceed. It is not um, it's not as fail safe as if council were to change the effective dates of those provisions. Um, but I take it that uh, there's a a little bit of um, um, anxiety over the effect of doing that without giving it more thought at the present time. I'll, I'll make a comment here. I, I still have to go along with what originally Mr. Stevens said. We just spent a lot of time talking about this ordinance. We talked about things and even though it was brought up, nobody suggested that we change the effective date. I just can't say Mr. Townsend uh, what would be the problem with leaving the effective date as it is? What what would be it, what would be perceived as a problem? Oh, it's it's not a problem. It's just that on the one hand, you are restricting people's um, property rights in terms of telling them they must build to a smaller square footage, um, but you are giving um, them a period of time to uh, file under the old law. Um, or Correct. Under uh, because the, the new law is not effective for 180 days. Which helps that property owner, correct? Um, it helps the property owner if they want to be considered under the existing law. But the, the another portion of the ordinance that you just passed relaxes the code. And, you know, do you need, there's no, there's no, there's probably no benefit in telling someone that they can enjoy the relaxed code, but only after six months. So th that's the distinction. The, their property rights are expanded, but only after six months. And, and I don't, don't counties and cities and towns consistently change zoning codes and and the property owners, a very few are benefit, or very few it's detrimental to, and a very and the vast majority it sort of evens it out the playing field. Doesn't that happen all the time? And do do they consistently try to change it for one, you know, give a separate date for of implementation for one group and not for another? I think what you're saying is is correct. I there's just a public policy um, behind delaying the effective date when you're reducing somebody's property rights. So the question is, is there the same public policy behind delaying the effective date when you're relaxing restrictions on someone's property? That, that's the distinction that, that I- Thank, that, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Mr. Steven, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a motion that we open up the prior ordinance so that we can make any necessary changes that we did not bring up that we should have before it was closed went to a vote. Oh, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll do a second, but yeah, I have a comment on that. I mean, now, we wait did a minute. say- Hold on one second, you did a second. Uh, Mr. Stevens, do you want to comment on the reasoning for your motion? 
Because my reasoning is because I think as a group, we were focused on the setbacks, the two and a half versus three foot. Um, and I don't think we added this comment that was brought up to us at the time. Even if it's a two minute discussion, a three minute, I, I'm not, I don't want to belabor it, but I don't, I think we're trying to do what's fair for the town residents of doing. And I don't think it's fair to just close it being that it was a consideration by some, but not, not accurately represented in the prior motion. Thank you, Mr. Bauer, you go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we said we were gonna talk about implementation after the ordinance. So now we're talking about it, but we're saying it's closed. We're not gonna talk about it. So I'd like to reopen I didn't it. say that. A way to do it. Let's, you know, I think, what's the right thing to do for the property owners? That's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish here. So I think where things are gonna be relaxed, let's not make them go to board of adjustments. Let's save them the hassle of doing it. They're probably already, you know, they're feeling whatever they feel about us right now. So yeah, let's not force this back to Board of Adjustments. Let's pass it clean and let's move on from it. Well, is there anybody else who wants to speak for or against the motion? Then, then I'll speak for or against the motion. I'm against the motion. It's gonna open the whole thing back up again as if we waited until next month to discuss the whole ordinance. If the motion was to say that if it was absolutely limited to section 10 implementation, then I might be for it, but I can't see opening up the whole thing over again. That, that's gonna be a bag of worms here. Mr. Persinger. Yeah, I, again, I, I think it's probably not a good idea to open it up at this time. I'm not sure that there uh, is anything time critical for some of these property owners in order to be able to take advantage of some of the relaxed provisions within the code. I think if we took another 30 days, we can let this sit for a while and if there is a, a good, sound, uh, well-developed motion that, that could be offered at that time, we could then consider it at the next meeting in terms of how best to, to implement this thing. If, if in fact, we, we wanna make any changes at all. I think, I think time, we, we'd be better served by taking a little more time with this. Mr. Jaszynski, did you have your hand up? You're, You're muted. muted. Your mic, your mic, Mr. Jaszynski. Mic trying to spare you from my dog's barking. Um, I just think we're kind of going in circles here, guys. So, um, and it's just too confusing opening the whole darn thing up. And I think there's unintended consequences. So I don't think we should reopen it. All right, there's a motion and a second on the floor. I'll call the question. Um, Mr. Persinger. I vote no. Mr. Chizinski. I vote no. Mr. Stevens. Oh, yes. Mr. Bauer. Yes. And Mayor Commissioner Cook votes no. And I'm just not willing to open it all up again. Yeah, so we stand, right now it stands as if it's the uh, way it's written, 180 days of implementation. Is there anybody else that wants to make a motion concerning that? Like, Mr. like Bauer. to make a motion? Yes, yeah, I'd sir. like to make a motion that if people have I, I, I'm in favor of not making them wait if any of our new zoning to, to, you know, have it take place. If they want to do, if they want to get something done before summer, I don't want to tell them to wait till September to do it. September, uh, you know, that's crazy to me. But there's people, you know, why, why delay what somebody's going to do today? Uh, well, that doesn't. You, you know, want to rephrase your motion there, so you. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to amend, I'd like to make a motion that would allow people. To sub, you know, to go with new guidelines now that we just passed for whatever construction they're doing. There's a motion on the floor. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that for purposes of discussion because I want to discuss this. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Bauer, did you want to make a? There's a proper motion second on the floor. Did you want to discuss your motion first? Yeah. So, and I guess the only thing that we're dealing with here now is 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 when this setback goes into place, if I understand this right. So we're at 15. Some people wanted less than that. We agreed on 12. But as we stand right now, we said it's 12, but you can't do it for six more months, which takes us till the fall. Mm -hmm. I would like to, you know, say that where we passed it at, if you want to take advantage of because it suits suits you better allowing them to do that now without going to Board of Adjustments. So you're saying your motion would would only hold off implementation of the 12-foot setback? Correct. 
Okay. That would make Yeah, it, I mean, they, they, they can use the 12 foot setback now as opposed well, to- I'm sorry, setback. they can use the 12 foot. You're, you're correct, I'm sorry. Mr. Jaczynski, your comment. So I, I go back to what I said before, and it was kind of a question that in all the back and forth, um, I, I don't think Fred actually had a chance to, to answer. My question to our town solicitor is, can we allow the people a chance on an individual property basis, that's only for their property, to accelerate the implementation of the zoning as it applies to their property only from the 180 day period, but they have to take everything. They can't just take side yard setbacks and keep the old uh, uh, floor area ratio, for instance. They have to basically take it all or they have to wait the 180 days. It's a, it's a really interesting question. It's, it's never been presented to me before. Um, I, I think it's uh, clever, but I'm not comfortable um, saying that it can be done. Okay, so my, my position on this is unless, unless we can do it for all of the different rules, we should not be doing it because there will be unintended consequences mm -hmm. of people mix and matching elements from the different zoning codes. Is there any other comments from the commissioner? Mr. Persinger. I think uh, Commissioner Jasinski's point earlier was that some of these provisions really are interconnected. And if you allow them to take advantage of the 12 foot setback, then they also have the advantage of uh, some of the less restrictive uh, limitations on square footage. Um, I, I, I really think that probably we may end up settling on the best strategy here uh, to simply um, uh, relieve the property owner of any appeal fee to the, to the Board of Adjustment. And let the Board of Adjustment consider uh, whether or not they could take advantage of that 12-foot um, uh, setback, uh, but in the context of all the other things that the property owner wants to do with that particular property, and then make, make a decision on that basis. Excuse me. Ashley, can I ask you, can you read back what the motion was as said, or do you have that? I don't have the full motion stated. I do have the time slot to go back to reference it. Um, but I, the note that I have says to allow people to go forward now with guidelines for whatever construction they're currently doing. Um, and I just have the, the timeline of when I can go back to listen verbatim. Well, let me let me ask Commissioner Bauer then. You're, I, I, I just want to understand what most, what we're voting on. I said, well, that it affected the 12 foot setback mm -hmm. versus 15 foot setback and you right. only, and you said yes. Right. So what is your motion? My motion specifically is to allow the 12 foot setback to be applicable today as opposed to 180 days from now. Okay, and Mr. Jaszewski, you seconded that motion. I didn't second it the way he's just stated it. I seconded something that sounded different. So he needs a sec. He needs to get a second from somebody else. I because I'm not seconding it in that format. Hold on one second. I hate to make this an issue, Mr. Townsend. Is there? Is there? We have a problem here. Can that motion be removed and then restated? <laughs> well, my original comment was going to be that that we're essentially, again, um, voting to reopen our consideration of the, the ordinance. So we need to proceed in that fashion. And that the, the latter initiative, the one that Mr. Bauer just made was more restricted than the original motion to reopen that failed. The original motion to reopen was more general. And I think it probably doesn't bar consideration of a second motion to reopen, to, to reconsider uh, section 10 only. So, so Mr. Townsend, in effect then we're on, we, we have to, for lack of a better term, drop the original motion and go with what Mr. Bauer just restated. Is that correct? Which, which I would interpret to be a motion to reopen, to reconsider section 10 um, so as to um, implement the relaxation of the side yard setbacks for corner lots uh, immediately leaving the remainder of the provisions effective in 180 days. Mr. Bauer is that your intent? Mr. Bauer your mic? Yeah I'm mute. He said yes. Yep. Yes that's correct. So okay. you need a, is there you need a second, second for that motion? I second that motion. Who's that? Mr. Stevens? No. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Stevens, didn't recognize your voice there. Mm -hmm. 
You're so quiet. I thought so you'd like a, that, like it that way. <laughs> there's a proper motion in the second on the floor. Is there any further discussion? I will make a comment that I feel that opening this back up sets, sets mm -hmm. uh, a precedent and we're gonna go down a rabbit hole here uh, <laughs> to reconsider this motion. And I don't think we should start that. I think we should just leave it as is with 180 days. But the motion is there on the floor. Uh, I'll call the question. I'll go as I see you on my screen. Commissioner Persinger. Yeah, I am going to vote against this motion uh, for the reason that I, I believe it's it's too early to make a decision like this. I think we should have a little more time uh, and make a considered decision on whether or not, you know, I, I'm receptive to trying to provide some, some help to a property owner who wants to take advantage of this provision, but I'm not sure that we have uh, thoroughly considered all of the other effects of doing so. And I think we should okay. have a little more time to do that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jasinski. Uh, I vote no. Mr. Stevens. I vote yes. Mr. Bauer. I vote yes. And you've already heard my thoughts on this matter. I think it opens it up for too much. Uh, to, we don't want to go month after month changing this this uh, regulation we've just instituted, so I vote no on the motion. If motion fails. Mr. Townsend, I'd like to ask you a question before we move on to the next item. Um, how often can can a zoning finance, excuse me, a planning and zoning regulation be brought back up for changes, comments, suggestions, whatever, over, you know, for instance, we've just passed this regulation. Is there any restriction on, on changing it next month or the month after or the month after that? The, the only restriction would be that if um, property owners relied on the passage, you know, re relied on the law to their detriment. Um, right. You, you could have difficulties there with vested rights, but um, um, there's no there's no restriction in the code or in state law or in your charter or in your your rules of procedure that would prohibit you from taking an issue up a second time. Thank you, very, thank you, sir. I, I appreciate the comment. Uh, well. Well, we've passed the regulation, the re legislation as of now takes effect 180 days from now, all provision. So we go to item three, oh, it's a long meeting. Discuss and possibly vote to direct the town solicitor to prepare an ordinance for instituting the town commissioner approved Dewey Beat lodging tax, open parentheses, to become effective April 1st, 2021, close parentheses, as authorized by the Delaware State Legislature in August 2020. Um, is there anybody that would like to, Mr. Like Jasinski and then Mr. Bauer? Yeah, so I, I think I brought this to your attention, Dale, so I'll try to kind of explain what I'm trying to do here, I think. Um, I think from a budget perspective, um, we need to know what we're gonna do for the next budget year. And that's why I, you know, I originally wanted this on the agenda. Um, I think April 1st is too soon for these guys. They've been in a world of hurt. Uh, clearly, the hotel industry is still going to be uh, suffering occupancy issues uh, after April 1st, given our current course and speed. Uh, my opinion is that, you know, this has been sitting out there and we need to get it done. It's just a question of what date. Um, I think the earliest date we should do it is July 1st, and I think the latest date we should do it is January 1st. And I'm hoping that the commissioners can just talk about it and we can just kind of agree on a date and then correct the draft. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bauer, you were next, and then Mr. Yeah. Persinger. I agree with what David just mentioned there. Uh, you know, I, I spent a good deal of time this week. You know, I spoke to uh, Carol Everhart of Chamber of Commerce, talked to Delaware Tourism, talked to a number of hotel people. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think we all agree that this revenue stream should be something that the town has. I just don't think it's a, a good time to do it, as, especially the conditions that we're in. It's the worst year in hotels' uh, recent history here, anyhow. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that, you know, we can pass something, but not have it take effect till January 1 of next year. Uh, and I say that because people have already booked rooms for this summer. 
what tax are they going to pay? Are they going to pay the day they show up or the date we pass this and versus their booking date? I just think it gets messy. Uh, you know, if we put it uh, at a, a point out, I think it's convenient to, to all. Uh, I don't think we were going to, you know, if we put this in in July, we're only going to you know, really get five weeks worth of tax revenue on it. Anyhow, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be, you know, be worth it, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Uh, Cause I think there's a bigger conversation to have uh, on, on this topic, but if we uh, do prepare something to discuss it, let's do it for an implementation of January 1, 2022. Mr. Bowers, it's all right with you since I had already said, Mr. Persinger was coming after you. If after his comments, I come right back to you and you can make your motion. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, Mr. Persinger. Yeah, I, I am a big supporter of, of this particular tax. I think it's appropriate. It's a, it's a visitor tax. I, I believe that at some point we should get to the full 3% uh, that we were authorized by the state legislature. Having said that, I don't think this is the year to do it. Um, and I think I've said that in the past. Um, I think the hotels have suffered. Um, and I think we should give them every possible competitive advantage possible this summer. Uh, to, to become healthy again. I mean, the business community is certainly a part, an important part of, of Dewey Beach as a whole. The hotels are an important part of that. Um, and again, I think we should give them every, every possible advantage. I, I think this is something that we should keep in our back pocket. I don't think we should look at this as um, the way to balance our budget, either now, uh, necessarily or in the future. I know that when we, we approve this tax and, and agreed that we would take it to the state legislature for its authorization, the governor's authorization, uh, that we would talk about a specific purpose for which it would be used. Um, I think right now, I believe we can balance our budget with the resources that we have. I think this should be looked at as a time of belt tightening, not uh, belt expansion uh, in, in any sense. Uh, and I just think we have to be as frugal as possible with our resources. I, I don't agree that we should set a date certain for implementation of this tax. I think there's, there's no obligation for us to uh, implement this or impose this tax at any particular time. I think we should keep it in our back pocket, continue to look at our resources, continue to look for um, really critical needs for which uh, this tax could be applied. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not in favor of setting a date certain by which we would impose it. You're not in favor of what, sir? setting a date certain by which we would impose the tax. Mr. Bauer, I promise to come back to you for- Yeah. yeah I, Mr. Stevens, I promise to come back to Mr. Bauer first after Mr. Persinger, so I'd have to go along with that. Go ahead, Mr. Bauer. So when we go, you know, if I look at what we have on our agenda, it talks about some, you know, to have Fred prepare something. Fred can right. prepare, we, he can put January 1st, 2022, he could put January 1st, 2023, but unless he puts a date, we're never going to get it on the agenda to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So uh, my motion would be to put it up, you know, let's put it up, just change the date of it to January 1, 2022. We may agree that it's 2023 or 2024. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But if we, you know, if we don't put a date, if Fred's not going to prepare an agenda. Thank you, Mr. So Fred, Steve. you have to put a date on there for, you know. What? I'm sorry, sir. For us to have an ordinance to look at, discuss, and vote, and take public uh, comment on, uh, don't we have to have an ordinance out there? Oh. The answer ahead, yeah. to, to implement the tax, you, you're going to need to notice an ordinance, and we should post an ordinance around that discussion. And that ordinance is always going to have an effective date language in it. Typically, the, the effective date for, for an ordinance is upon enactment. In this case, the, the General Assembly has indicated, and I think we consented to that uh, in our original ask of the General Assembly, that we would not impose the tax before April the 1st. So this kind of discussion actually is similar to, the, to what some people thought was problematic about the last item, in which we sort of had a consensus on one day, and then we had all our options available on the date that we would enact the ordinance next month, let's say. So, um, it, the question is, do you want to, I think the question should be, do you want to consider an ordinance next month? And at that point, you, you could either decide to defer it or decide you want to enact it, and then you could decide what the effective date would be. Um, well, Mr. Bauer has made a motion to, to discuss and possibly vote to have you create an ordinance effective January 1st, 2022. 
Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second by Mr. Jasinski. Now we have discussion on the motion. Okay, so if I could, I would just, I would um, warn you against revisiting the issue of the effective date when we take this up again, because you're passing a motion saying you don't want it to be effective until January the 1st. And there no, are we're passing a motion to have you created an ordinance that we would then discuss and vote on. So, so the issue of its implementation date or effective date is, is entirely up in the air. It's, it's fair game for the commissioners when the ordinance is passed. Is it, well, is the motion right? said, uh, yes, it's fair game for the, okay. the, the motion said for you initially to put down January 1st, 2022 for Understood. discussion. All right. Understood. All right. Is there, uh, we I, have I a motion amend. in a second, Mr. Stevens. I'm sorry, Mr. Bauer, you can speak to your motion. Yeah, I, I, I'd be willing to amend my motion. Am I allowed to do that, Fred? The, just remove the date section of it. Mr. Townsend, go right ahead and answer that question. <clears throat> he can if um, the seconder agrees. Yeah, I agree to that. Oh. Let's do it okay. that way then. So, Mr. So, Stevens, you had your hand up numerous times until yeah. now I can get to you. At this point, it doesn't matter, Dale. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Mr. Persinger, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm, my point is just simply that we don't need a, 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 an ordinance at this point. We don't need to have one drafted. We don't need to consider one next month or, or uh, April or, or June. We can have an ordinance drafted at any time we want um, and to make the effective date at any time we want. You know, my point is this is not a critical piece of uh, revenue that we have to have right at the moment. I think there's a lot of discussion that should be made about how we would use the funds that would be generated by this. I don't think we even have a good idea of how much revenue would be generated. You know, we, we got some um, information from, um, from the Hyatt uh, regarding uh, how much the Sussex County tax, I believe it was, had generated. I'd like to take a closer look at that and see if we can um, come up with some idea of how much money we might actually generate from this and then begin to think about what the uses would be. I just, don't, I just think it's premature at this point to begin to uh, uh, pass an ordinance um, with a date certain for, for effective. I know that's part, not part of the motion now. I just don't think there's a need for an ordinance at this point. All right, I'm, I'm gonna go to Mr. Stevens and then call the question. Yeah, I, I get, gentlemen, my, I have a few different comments. One, I agree with what was the underlying opinion that it's, it's, an in, it's improper or inappropriate to enact a tax on the hotels after what could have been or what was a devastating year last year during COVID at a lower rate. Um, I would encourage us to pass an ordinance with an effective date so that letting the hotels know that there will be a tax next year so that we can have funds for general fund. And we also just had an hour and a half conversation on the infrastructure and in the systems that we have that are going to cost 200000 for one street, $2 million for another. So I disagree with Commissioner Persinger that the funds aren't going to be needed in the future. The whole basis of this conversation a few years ago was based upon the fact that we need sustainable revenue streams. And if we keep getting, kicking this can down the road, then we're going to find out it's going to, we're going to fall short. And there's no reason set up for set us, setting us up for failure. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, I'm going to move on with the, we said I would call the question after you, after your comment. I'm going to call the question now, which is to, to have Mr. Townsend create a, a um, ordinance that uh, will institute the commissioner approved Dewey Beach lodging tax with no date in, an, in the ordinance. So um, I'll call the question as I see the roll call here. Mr. Persinger? I'm going to vote no. Again, I don't believe we need an ordinance at this point. We are not setting ourselves up by failure by, by not passing an ordinance at this point. Um, you know, we can easily get to the to the one and a half percent that we are authorized to get to um, through, through an ordinance at some time in the future. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it's clear we're going to need it. There's no question we're going to need it. But let, let's just have some more discussion about what we're going to need it for, what we're going to apply it to before we implement it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jasinski. Uh, aye. You vote aye. Mr. Steven. Approved. Aye. Mr. Bauer. Aye. And Mayor Commissioner Cook votes aye. 
So that will, Mr. Townsend, you were so instructed to have a proposed draft ordinance for the next town meeting. Okay, we'll move on to item number four. Discuss and possibly vote to approve draft ordinance, amend chapter 93 fees of the Municipal Code of the Dewey Beach, Delaware, 2005 as amended by amending section 93.5 relating to parking permit fees. Um, this was originally brought up by Mr. Jasinski and I'd like to do two things. Number one, have him comment on it. And then Mr. Zolper would like to comment with the possibility of our department head commenting. So Mr. Jasinski first. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the idea for this started with the business community uh, when I basically asked, what can we do to help you in this? And one had a suggestion and then I got some concurrence around it that the areas where parking costs 20 bucks, even if you just wanna walk in a place to get a hamburger for an hour, um, causes people to not wanna go there. Um, so uh, our, our code enforcement director, Merle, uh, was quite um, helpful in providing some uh, background information on what could and could not be done with Park Mobile uh, on this. And I believe that uh, uh, she also has some thoughts overall on our parking pricing strategy. So I'll turn it over to our mayor and director of code enforcement to kind of go over their thoughts, both on the proposal itself, as well as some thoughts that uh, they have about what kind of direction we should be taking. Well, going to our town manager, not the mayor. Yeah, the town manager, I call him mayor? Yeah, sorry about that. Mr. Zola. We're, we're going long, we're going long today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, commissioners. I greatly appreciate it. As, as a town manager, one of the things I'm gonna try to do in the future is we have discussions like this, bring our, our department heads in. They're supposed to be the experts in these areas. They're supposed to be the ones that are on the ground doing this work. And we're paying them money for that, whether it's the, the captain uh, of the beach patrol, whether it's uh, the chief of the police or whether it's uh, code enforcement, the director of code enforcement. So I asked Merle last night and yesterday to put some, just some bullets together, uh, some thoughts together. And uh, she's gonna do that. And then again, at the end of the day, I wanted to make sure she understood when a decision is made one way or the other, if we make any decision, that decision is made by me, the town manager, and by the commissioners. Just because she's bringing these things up, um, and if whether the whether we vote on it and we accept it and it works or doesn't work, shouldn't fall back on her. As commissioners and as a town manager, it should fall back especially on me. So with that, uh, Merle, I would turn it over. Hi. Hello, Merle. Hi. How are you today? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, uh, I can't hear you. You're, you're, you're speaking, but you're broken up and low. No. I can barely hear you now. Um, I would ask our town clerk, is it possible to give her a dial-in number where she could just make a phone call and participate audio, if that worked better for her? I was going to ask if you want me to try to call her directly and just put her on speaker with my speaker near the speaker here, like we've done. Yeah, that that'll work. That, that's fine. I love technology. I don't feel so bad, bad about being a dinosaur, Mr. Stevens. You, you know a lot more than I do. You were laughing at me the other day when we were on the phone. You're fine, Dale. Hi, perfect. Okay, can you guys hear? Merle, can you talk to see? Yep, can you guys hear me? Go yes, ahead, Merle. Yes. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I know um, there was a discussion about adding um, hourly parking to the parking permits. Currently, we have um, different zones and different prices. Um, 4012 is the parking permit zone all over town. The, park, the parking permit is 
$15 a day from Monday and Wednesday, and then it changes to $20 a day Thursday through Sunday. So I want to talk a little bit about cruising. So cruising is basically, I'm sorry. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, so cruising is basically searching for a parking space. Charging the right price for parking means that no one should be cruising. So there's been studies saying that the pr if people are cruising for parking spaces, then we are not charging the right, pr the right price. We have that in DOA. We have people looking for parking spaces all the time. It causes congestion, accidents, and speeding because everyone's trying to get the space. Um, so I think charging for parking, the price has to be right. I think there's certain streets that need to be higher in price. And I think there's certain streets that, that need to be lower in price. Um, whether we implement a four hour permit up to 24 hours or we just stay as what we are, I think that um, the price of parking should be at a value. And the streets that are very congested don't have a value at this point. Any questions? Yeah, I, I've got some questions. Go ahead, Mr. Chuzinski, go ahead. So I, I like your concept of variable pricing and value. Um, the, the main question, the first question I have is, it sounds like it would be something that would require that we have multiple different zones uh, for different streets, um, as well as potentially different signage that we'd have to implement. And we'd have to figure out how we reconcile Park Mobile with, uh, you know, for instance, the machine and whatnot, and with the meters, a lot of different moving elements. Um, and the initial proposal was to try to get something in place for this summer season. So I really like your idea about doing it, but do you see being able to do that, what I would call location and time specific parking, do you see that being a larger project that might take, you know, maybe over the course of six months to a year to kind of figure out how we're going to do it? I do. I think it, this is a larger discussion, um, but I do. I don't think that we need to create different zones. Mm -hmm. um, Four zero one two is basically it is parking permits, and it's the same everywhere. Right. So. The only zone that we would have to change would be that all the other zones can stay the same. So if we implement the four hour up to 24 hour parking permit, all we have to do is add another zone. It's not a big deal. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we need to think about charging the right price. I think that this is a bigger discussion. Um, Mr. We lost you after a bigger discussion. Oh, is that better? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so I said this is a bigger discussion. Um, I think that jumping into implementing four hour parking permits to 24 hours, um, it without a bigger discussion, I don't think that we should apply it as of right now. Um, I think we all need to talk about what streets demand higher prices and what streets do not demand higher prices. So um, I, I wanna understand from you why you think an interim step, because the legislation that's proposed is, is only effective for this year unless we extend it as an interim step to just allow a four hour lower charge, why that's a bad idea to do right now? Well, I, I don't think we, we would have the pricing right. Um, so for instance, Dickinson, Bayside and Oceanside are very highly populated. So with that being said, the price is too high if many spaces 
are vacant and the price is too low if no spaces are vacant. So we have to adjust the price that we are going to charge. Okay. I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Jasinski, I'm going to stick with the town manager temporarily and ask the town manager and Merle, if through, through the town manager, Merle, uh, are, are you on board with this, these changes? Is Merle, Merle, are you on board and town manager, are you on board with the suggested changes? I am. I think uh, having discussions with Merle both yesterday and today, I think that um, her concept with, uh, uh, with, with the commissioner's concept of trying to get a, um, a price for four hours of parking that will allow people to go get uh, you know, dinner somewhere downtown. And then also talking to Merle where she's listed five streets that are high volume streets like Dickinson Street, Dagsworthy, Swedes, New Orleans, and maybe uh, parts of Bayard. Those streets have a lot of traffic going up and down looking for parking. So those are streets where people want to park. So those streets, if we do a four hour block for them through the mobile app, we should be able to charge more for those, for those uh, four hours. And the thought process is, and Merle, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you go into a bar or restaurant down on Dickinson Street and you go in and you're doing the four hours and you get in there and you find that it took longer to get dinner, you can just get on your mobile app and add more time. If you make your dinner and you have it and you're done and you're able to move out in four hours, that spot opens up, somebody else can pull in and they have to do a minimum of four hours. So there'll be some more turnover. Merle, do I have that right? Yeah, yep. So again, Merle, if you answer my question, are you on board with the suggested changes in the proposed ordinance? As of today? Excuse me? As of today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jasinski, one more question from me, then I'll open it up to question. the rest of the commissioners. What? Merle she didn't asked. answer the question. Yeah, she, she said, said as of today. She was asked. I asked I if it was as of today. Oh, I, sorry. I thought, thought that was a statement, not a question. Go ahead, Merle. As of today, I would say no, I am not on board. In the future, yes, I'm on board. Like I said, I think this is a larger discussion. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to understand Hold if you on feel one second, that's... Mr. Jasinski. Yeah, Mr. Jasinski, does your does the ordinance that we were presented to vote on does that have anything to do other than adding the four hour block in? It doesn't have the graduated fees that the town manager was talking about. Is that correct? That, that, that is correct. Okay, go ahead now. I'm sorry. So, go ahead, Mr. Jasinski. I, I just want to be real quick with Merle. There's. There's two sides to your answer. One is a policy side, which very, it's very clear from a policy perspective uh, that you feel that this, the whole parking structure has got to be revisited. Um, but what, one thing we need to know is because we're trying to figure out how to provide some relief for businesses here, as well as visitors for that matter. Um, is there a technical reason why this won't work? Like the machine won't do it or something like that? Talking about the four hour. Correct. <clears throat> There's no technical reason. Okay. You said there is no technical reason? Correct. There's no te technical reason for us to not be like this. Gotcha. Okay. So, Mr. Zizinski, but what you, what you gave us is strictly just the four hour uh, verge, uh, the ability to create four hours other than just the whole day. Is that correct? That is correct. The other commissioners, do you have any comments on this? Mr. Persinger. Um, I, I'm certainly um, sympathetic to the spirit of what we're trying to do here. I just want to understand what the implication is on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of a four hour rate for $10. Those are the days in which we have free parking already, I believe from, is it five to 11? That's is that correct. correct. It's 11 to 2 a.m. Oh, I'm sorry, 11, five to 11 is free parking. And after right. that, it, we turn it back on to charge. Okay, so we got that. We got that, Merle. Thank you. Okay, so is, is this $10 rate for those three days, does that really achieve some useful purpose? I'm, I'm not clear. I mean, it, if somebody wants to stay until 2 a.m., then, you know, they can do it for 10 bucks, but, you know, they probably could, I don't know. I, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure what the, the impact is on those three days. 
I could answer the question if you'd like. Mr. Jasinski, go ahead and answer that. I just want to answer the question. I set the rates or I requested or proposing the rates to be consistent with what we charge it in parking meter. And that's that's the only thing that's behind the ten dollars is that's the same as the meter charges on those days. Mr. Bauer, you got a comment? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to take a little different approach to this, whatever numbers we come up with, I'm, I'm going to be happy with. But, you know, we can work out on the math. But if we put ourselves in the visitor's shoes, the person that's actually coming in and use it. And, and I go through town and I know what 4012 does, but how many of our guests know what 4012 is? Yeah, is there a way to mark the signage that says these are meters, this is permits, you know, and okay. put a not sign or something. But, you know, it just, just to explain it better to people, because there's a lot of our tickets, and Merle, you could probably confirm this, that, you know, where they complain afterwards, oh, I didn't know I had to put the PC in, or, uh, oh, I parked it, I have a permit, but I parked in a meter, and I get a ticket there, you know, and those events happen probably you know, I hear about them a lot, but I, you know, Merle could probably be a better judge of how many people, you know, they, they, these are things that people dislike about us. And I'd like to try to get into the business of what people like about us versus dislike. Are you asking that if, if there was, if there is or is not enough signage to explain it? Well, I'm just saying simplify the signage. I mean, we got a lot of words on that and that sign, um, but it does predominantly say 4012. So that is a permit spot that a guest might not, you know, they're going to go up the ones that they should read the sign, but they don't always. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I think we could do a better job of that to our uh, guests. Thank you for your comment. So you're not looking for an answer. You, you wanted to make No, no, I'm just making a comment on this subject. Okay. Is there any other comments on the ordinance before you all now? Because that's all we're being asked to enact, if, if, yes or no. Is that correct, Mr. Jasinski? That's all I'm asking is to just enact this ordinance as written. If there's no further comments, I'll call the question then. There's a, wait a minute, I, I, did, did I actually get a motion on this? I That's my motion. That's my motion. I motion Your to motion approve is, it as written. Okay, is there a second for the motion? I'll second. Mr. Person, do a second. Mr. Jasinski made the motion. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? I'll go at, I'll call the question and go if we go in order here. Mr. Persinger? I vote aye. Mr. Jasinski? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. Mr. Bauer? Aye. And as long as we're voting just on the ordinance that we are now, Mayor Commissioner Cook votes aye also. It passes unanimously. Uh, next question is number five. If, and I'll read off, but I want to tell you some discuss and possibly vote to approve supplement to the town of Dewey Beach Street and Bait Beach Maintenance Agreement with Dell Dot. I would ask, and Jim Deedes and I both ask that you postpone this one until next meeting. We are not prepared to address it today. So we'll go to item number six discuss and possibly vote to approve a draft resolution to approve an additional benefit to the town of Dewey Beach employees for eye coverage as being offered by the state of Delaware to begin July 1st, 2021. And I'll ask town manager to address this. Yes, uh, thanks Mr. Mayor. So starting July 1st of 2021, the state of Delaware is gonna be offering participating groups including the town of Dewey Beach eye coverage. Currently, the folks that are still, uh, that are employees here have 100% coverage and all the new employees coming in uh, per an ordinance would do the 2080. The cost per year from that, and Sheena, correct me if I'm wrong, annually, annually for the folks who have 100% to stay 100% and the folks that have come on that are 2080 would be $4,545. Is that correct, Sheena? Sorry, I hear her because I'm next door to her, but you didn't. And that's correct. Very good. Thank you, Sheena. Go ahead, Mr. Sulkler. So, sir, I would, I would ask that the, the town commissioners consider that. I think it's a good program. I think it's part of taking care of our employees here um, in the town of Dewey Beach. Mr. Bauer. I'd like to make a motion to approve this. 
to approve the draft draft resolution. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Is there a second for that motion? Is there a second for the motion? I, I'll second for discussion. Yeah, for discussion. Second for discussion, Mr. Thanks, Perkinger. Mr. Perkinger, do you ever want to make a comment? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, ahead. Mr. Bauer, you made the motion. Do you want to comment on your motion? Yeah, I, you know, and I, I echo what the, uh, what our town manager has mentioned here and, and Bill, you know, I agree, you know, it's, it, this is a benefit that we're offering to our employees. It's coming through the state. Um, the fact that we don't really offer vision now is, you know, a little surprising because I think competitively we want to reward the people that we have with the, you know, best benefits we can. I think that's a fair thing to do. So I, I yeah, my position is I, uh, I'm, I'd be in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Persinger. Since you second, did you want to make a comment? Then, Mr. Well, Stevens. Yeah, my comment is, I mean, I, I think it's a worthwhile benefit to, to add. Um, I know that vision coverage is, is typical in most uh, compensation packages, and once you get as old as I am, and you're on Medicare, you don't have any vision coverage. So this is this is a nice <laughs> thing to have. Um, my question is: Is it not possible to? require all employees to contribute toward the cost of this, to contribute 20%. Um, I mean, I, I think the trend is for, uh, and I, I understand the situation now that, that current employees uh, do have the 100% coverage, but I, I think that's a disappearing uh, benefit level. And I'm wondering if we could ask all employees to, to pay 20% of this coverage. And I'm assuming uh, I, it's going to be elective that, coverage. Is that a comment or are you asking a question of somebody in particular? Um, well, it, it's a comment. I, I believe it, if it's possible to do so, I think they should be asked to pay 20% of the premium. Thank you for that comment. Mr. Stevens. Uh, yeah, this is more, this is a, more of a comment having gone through benefit plans like this. I would encourage us to uh, look at this amendment as a full adoption for all employees with the same coverage and the same level of payroll deductions. Um, there's an element of discrimination in discrimination testing, if you offer coverage that is uh, more expensive to less employed, less er lower earners than higher earners. And so I, 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 I'd ask that you guys consider just making it a, a bring on the benefit and have the same deductible for everyone, or else you may be violating a discrimination clause. Mr. Jadinsky, do you have a comment? No, I do not have a comment. Okay, I, then I'll go back to me because I've already heard from everybody else. Um, I, I don't believe that there's a, a discrimination here. We yeah. voted years ago. We voted years ago to any new personnel would pay eight, would, would pay 20% of their benefits package. And all we were doing is adding to the benefits package and people that now do not, people that now pay, a, pay nothing for their benefits package continue to get it until we are completely transferred over to new people who continue to pay 20% of their benefits package. So I don't think there's any, Mr. Townsend, would you like to comment? Do you think there's some form of discrimination there? Well, I do think that whatever contributions you look for should be part of your comprehensive um, policy, personal policy or employee policy manual, as opposed to being specific to this particular benefit. So I would be more comfortable if you enacted whatever changes you wanted to make uh, across the board, as opposed to just tacking it on to this resolution to add eye coverage at this time. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Are you saying about the 80-20 or just the eye benefit in general? I'm saying I, I wouldn't suggest that you enact the eye benefit or, or add the eye benefit um, and apply a different set of employee contribution rules to it, that those rules that apply to contributions would apply across the board. I'll get right to you in a second, Mr. Stevens. But that's what I'm saying is that we presently have uh, previous employees pay nothing, get 100% benefit. New and all new employees get an 80-20 split on it. They pay the 20, the town pays the 80%. That is a general statement for all employees. Is that what you're saying or not? Mr. Townsend. Oh, that's a question for me. I thought it was Yes, sir. I'm saying we we passed and we passed 
a resolution years ago that said new employees would pay 20% of their benefits package. Old employees would continue to get it because we didn't want to hurt the older employees. Older employees would continue to, previous employees would continue to get it for free. And this would be an extension, in my opinion, this would be an extension of that decision that come years ago. And, um, and Mr. Stevens said he thought it would possibly- I'm, I'm almost positive it's in violation of discrimination laws associated with employee benefits. Mr. All right, Mr. Townsend, would you comment? Um, Mr. Stevens, you're almost positive what's in violation of employee benefits. That you can't charge a certain class of people a different payroll deduction than other class of people. So, I mean, my advice is that you not attach any, uh, contra you know, specific contribution rules to this I benefit. You either adopt it or you don't. And then we can look at our, our employee policy manual to chase down any concerns we have along the lines of what Mr. Stevens is raising. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with Fred, and it's just more of a comment. Bill, or town manager, you may just want to ask your current broker if the policy is in violation of any current discrimination discrimination laws or not, but that doesn't change my thought on, on this amendment as written. Well, I, I don't know that it's... Um, hold on one second, please. As written, it, it does not address any Correct. cost of it. You're right, Mr. Correct. Stevens. Thank you very much. And so um, now that we've discussed a bit, who made the motion? Paul Bauer, you made the motion. I did. It, you, you're, it, you're, you're saying without any qualifications on, on we just adopt the I benefit, correct? Right. We, you know, let's be, let's, you know, treat just, everybody the same. Okay. That's, that's just, my opinion. So, and who seconded the amendment? Motion. Gary seconded it. Think I okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion then? Yes. Mr. Persinger. Um, I, I think, I certainly wouldn't assist on it, but I think there should be some reference to um, the, uh, the payment of the premiums being consistent with um, the town policy manual. Um, I think that would improve the motion. Um, but the other question I have is, is this an elected benefit? Is this something an employee could elect to, to take or not? You know, if it's not an elected benefit, then you are increasing the premium contribution for, a, for any new employee, any employee who's already currently subject to paying 20% of the cost of the benefit. It is elected. Um, I did my numbers based on, um, I have myself and my kids. Ashley has herself and a spouse. I did it based on what our current medical coverage is for the employees that take medical coverage and did the same coverage. I know Bill is only getting um, dental. If they only had dental, I did it the same thing. I based it on what people are getting, knowing that most of the people would probably keep the same thing. However, if they you know, don't wanna get it, they don't have to get it. Well, I mean, that, is there any need to put in this, this ordinance the fact that it is an elected benefit? That, that's just a question. No. Okay. Mr. Stevens, do you want to comment? I, 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 think, the, I think we should just vote on the ordinance. We've, we've discussed it as, unless Gary's making a motion to amend it. Um, if everyone else is comfortable with that, I'm not going to make a motion to amend it, no. Mr. Mr. Bauer made the motion to adopt the ordinance as, as it was, or to adopt the resolution as it was. So uh, I'll call the question. Mr. Persinger. I'll vote aye. Mr. Jasinski. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Commissioner Bauer. Mr. Bauer. Aye. Aye. And <laughs> Commissioner Mayor Cook votes aye also. I, as, as I understand Mr. Um, Townsend, then we will go along with what's ever in the policy manual presently right. as far as implementation of it. That's right. Okay. All right. Item number seven, discuss and possibly vote to approve a quote for the general code to codify the town code. And I'll go to Mr. Zolper again with that, and then he may deal with Ashley on that. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we have made some changes in the general code and we need to update it. The estimated cost on that is between $1,830 and $2,215. That includes shipping and handling uh, to update the code. Ashley, did I miss anything? Got everything. It's just um, putting all of the ordinances that have been Ashley, passed. could you speak up, please? It's just putting all of the ordinances that have been passed since the last codification into the actual code um, and to move out of the new laws section of the website. <clears throat> and, and I just have, I, I'm all for this, but I just have one question. Mr. Zolper, could you speak into the microphone here? What's the cost of the... So, so the cost, sir, is, is between uh, $1,830 and 200, or 2215 which includes shipping and handling. And if I remember correctly, had this been had this been under the, what it is normally under the two thousand dollars, the town manager could have just approved it originally themselves. Is that correct? Correct. If it's under two thousand. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. So, uh, is there a motion, Mr. Bauer. Motion to approve this. Second. Is there a second for the motion? Yes, Dave. Seconds. Okay, who, I'm sorry, who seconded? David. Mr. Jasinski seconded. Uh, we'll call the question, Mr. Persinger. I vote aye. Mr. Jasinski. Aye. Mr. Steven. Aye. Mr. Bauer. Aye. Mr. Cook says aye also. We'll move on to the next item. It passes unanimously, by the way, Ashley. Discuss and possibly vote to approve recommendation recommendation of the Town of Dewey Beach Marketing Committee about a possible fundraiser mm -hmm. to offset an item in the current town budget. I'll go to Mr. Bauer about this one. Yeah, this is a, and I really like the ideas that the Marketing Committee came up with here. So what the, the meeting on uh, February 5th, uh, what was discussed was, um, you know, what can the, can the town do some fundraising to take something out of our budget or, you know, out of our general fund budget and do fundraising to get the community to, uh, you know, raise money within the community to get it done. And the consensus was the, you know, the we'll call it beautification. Uh, and this is, uh, we have a bill from uh, Spasado, I believe, right, Ashley? And Spasado's, uh, it's a little over 30,000, 32,000, something like that. So what they want to do is, is uh, you know, try to go to the community and raise funds for that specific purpose. Uh, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's a very ambitious goal they have. And, and I'd be, uh, you know, very supportive of, uh, of their efforts to want to do that. You know, I go back many, many years when, you know, before we hired Spasado, that used to be something that the Civic League used to do for the town. And, uh, you know, it didn't cost the town anything, but it was great getting the community together. And everybody likes their town to look nice. And, uh, you know, and I think everybody's in the same boat with that. And, uh, you know, they're optimistic that they can raise that kind of money uh, uh, this year for. So I think that's I think it's a great thing. Any questions? Well, Mr. Bauer, would you like to read the, the, the what they passed unanimously at the marketing committee so that everybody understands? Yeah, the motion was made uh, by Alex, seconded by Ellen, passed unanimously. The marketing committee recommends the commissioners assign the committee to develop fundraising campaigns to raise $32,000 to cover the beautification line item for the town of Dewey. The committee will come back to the commissioners with recommendations on how to meet that goal. Their next meeting is scheduled. Well, that's the, the that's the part that we're passing. Uh, their next scheduled meeting is February 18th at 6 p.m. For anybody who would like to attend and and weigh in on that, but uh, that's the uh, you know that's what they passed us to uh, have approved. And as I understand it, just discuss and possibly vote for the commissioner to discuss, think about it, and possibly vote to tell the committee that th so far they're online with this and as long as they're bringing it back to the commissioners for, for right. approval. Right. So uh, did you wanna make a motion to that effect? Yes, I would love to. I'd like to make a motion uh, to have the marketing committee uh, develop fundraising campaigns 
to raise uh, funds to cover the beautification line item for, uh, for the town. The committee uh, will make these recommend recommendations back to the uh, commissioners after their uh, February 18th, uh, 2021 meeting. Is there a second for that motion? There is a second from Mr. Stevens. Is there any further discussion? I'll call the roll then to Mr. Persinger. I vote aye. Mr. Jasinski. I'd like to thank the marketing committee for all their great work. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Bauer. Aye. And I, as mayor commissioner, vote aye also passed it unanimously. Next item is review the January 2021 financial. I'll go to the town manager for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So revenue expected for January. You skipped an item. What? You skipped an item, Mayor. You skipped nine. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. We'll we'll go we'll go to nine as soon as I we finish with this, if that's all right with you, Mr. Perkinger. Okay, the nine should be very quick. Okay. We'll go we'll go to we'll go to nine as, since we already started on this with the town manager. If it's all right, we'll go to this and then go back to nine. Is that okay? Okay. It's fine. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. So as of January, revenue expected uh, for the month was was uh, expected 124,824. Actual revenue for January was 288,328. The difference above expected is 163,504. Any questions on that? I'll continue to move on then. Expenses expected in January is 215,360. Actual expenses for January was 192,865. Difference below expected was 22,495. Any questions on that? Year to date revenue expected, 3,200,056,681. Actual year to date revenue is um, 3,474,725. A difference above expected of $218,044. Any questions on that? Year to date expenses uh, expected. Year to date expenses expected is 3,058,234. Actual year to date expenses is 3,000,000. Nine thousand uh, two hundred eighty-two difference below expected is forty-eight thousand nine five two or forty-eight thousand nine five two. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Year-to-date expected set asides was one hundred twenty-eight thousand twenty. Year-to-date set aside so far is uh, one hundred sixty-two thousand eight hundred fifty-four dollars. That's it, sir. Thank you very much. Is there any questions or comments that commissioners want to make to the town manager? Hearing none, we'll go back to item number nine, which thank you, Mr. Persinger, for reminding me. Discuss yeah. and possibly vote to schedule a joint meeting between the town commissioners, budget and finance committee, audit committee, and investment committee to work on development of a new general fund policy. Mr. Persinger, if you'll take the lead on this one. Yeah, I, I do think this could be very quick. Um, what's happened in the last few days is that we've actually talked to the auditors about this. This was a recommendation that came out of the last two audits. We've had a couple of very good conversations that included uh, the town manager, Commissioner Stevens, uh, and the chair of our audit committee, Julie Johnson. Um, we had a, a call a couple of days ago, I can't remember exactly which day, which is a very good call. After that call, I shared with them this draft document that I put together on fund balance policy for the general fund. And I now have back from them some comments. Uh, we had a call uh, this morning to talk about those comments. Commissioner Stevens was not able to, to join us, but the, the bottom line is there, they thought this, would, they think that the idea of a joint meeting is a good idea. Uh, it helps to get better buy-in on and better understanding of what the general fund ba balance policy should be about. Um, I do have some comments from them and I will be making some changes, but, you know, I, I think based on the conversations we've had with the auditors, it's a good idea to proceed with this, uh, to provide uh, a new version of this background document as the basis for, for that discussion. Uh, 
Um, and I think we're really on the way to, to, to solving this recommendation from the audit report that we need to have a, a general fund balance policy. So, I mean, with that, I, I would offer a motion that we, uh, we approve um, the uh, agenda item as described, which I'm trying to get back to. Um, you have a motion to approve this yeah, agenda we, item? That we, that we approve, that we vote to schedule a joint meeting with the town commissioners, budget and finance, audit and investment committees to work on the development of a new general fund balance policy. Thank you for reading that straight out. Commissioner Bauer, you, did you have your hand up to second yep. it? I was going to second it. Seconded by Mr. Bauer. Is the motion uh, properly moved and seconded on the floor? Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Commissioner Persinger? I vote aye. Commissioner Jasinski? Aye. Commissioner Stevens? Aye. Commissioner Bauer? Aye. And Commissioner Mayor Cook? Aye. Also unanimous. Uh, Last, uh, next to last item, review and discuss the fiscal year 2022 mm -hmm. proposed town budget development. That's going to go to Mr. Zolper to start that off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So with a lot of hard work from Sheena, we, we, have, um, we are right about at a balanced budget. As of today, we're about $269. Or Jim, if you have any comment on that also. So we're right where we, where we should be. I will say, though, uh, based on some other things that may come up, uh, we may have to look at about another $5,000 or so, if, if five to $10,000 if some things end up um, coming in and, and we have to pay for those. But as of today, we are at 269. Uh, Jim, any comment? Gina? Any questions, sir? Any question from the commissioner, from the <laughs> town manager? Nope. Hearing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Town Manager. Uh, we'll then go to Town Manager's comments. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate everybody's patience with some of the questions I've had uh, with Mr. Persinger and some of the others trying to figure out my left and right limits. It's been a great two weeks so far. Um, I can't say enough good things about everybody that's working here, Sheena, uh, Joyce, Kate, everybody over in the police department, everybody over in code enforcement. Uh, Don does a great job in, in, in our alderman and everybody else here. So thank you so much. I will say, though, uh, just to, to let the commissioners know, we currently have a tractor that was purchased in uh, 2005. Don has told me that um, it still is working and we should be able to resell it, but we are getting some issues with it and having to replace some of the parts on it. I will be suggesting with some of the money that is left over from 2021, and I'm not sure how the rules are on this, but that we purchase a, a new tractor for maintenance in, in the town. Just to give you some additional information, I'm getting three bids. Um, our maintenance uh, person, Don Richards, he is uh, approved and he's taken a course by DENREC. So he can operate in limited capacities around the dune. And when I say that, putting the mats down, moving the sand around, down around the lifeguard station, moving the sand around, we do have to have a reliable piece of equipment that does that. The current piece of equipment is currently working, but it's not going to last. And I feel we need to have a safer piece of equipment and we need to have a new piece of equipment. So I will be coming before the commissioners at, at some point to talk about that. Also, the phone system inside the, uh, the building here, it def desperately needs to be replaced. That'll be something that I'll, that I'll be uh, bringing up. I'm working currently on the uh, personnel policy manual. Also, looking at job descriptions for each individual person here, we really don't have good job descriptions for them. For me to evaluate how they're doing and say they're doing a good job or saying they're having some challenges, I need to have a job description for each one of these folks. So I've been working with Diane from HR uh, on, on that. Um, and so I can get you an evaluation system at some point. And again, I want to spend, send out a special thanks to uh, Jim and Sheena for all their help during the last week. Pending any questions, that's all I have. Any question for the town commissioner at this time? I'm mean, excuse me for the town manager, Mr. Stevens. Yeah, I just want to put out a suggestion. I, I, I agree with the town, the town manager, um, having worked with Sheena and, and Jim over this. You guys have did a great, great job uh, in your in interim when some Scott has left and a really great job working budget and finance, what we currently have and what's in place. Um, what I'd ask for, for the town to consider is to evaluate the capital expenditures. And that's what you were really referring to, Bill. What pieces of equipment, what pieces, what facilities 
are going to need to be replaced and, and to try to come up with some level of timing so we can project out our future cash requirements and be able to plan for it accordingly. But I think it's great that, you know, we've, we've got the budget, let's expand this, not just a single view, year viewpoint, let's have it as a two or three year viewpoint so we can give you everything you need to do your job eff efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Um, we'll now go to commissioner comment, commissioner Bauer. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be real brief here. I, I wanna thank uh, our new town manager here, Bill for taking the reins and and uh, jumping all over a lot of these issues. So, uh, you know, we, we appreciate what you do and uh, hopefully we stay out of your way and you let you do a great job for us. Uh, you know, let us know what, what we can do to help you, but uh, we're glad that, uh, that you're there in a the chair and, and uh, making things happen so quickly. So I uh, want you to know it's appreciated. Thank you. Commissioner Jasinski, comment. Uh, just, just welcome to our new town manager. That's all, she's doing a great job so far. Commissioner Persinger, comment. Yeah, I, I think the, the issue of ca uh, ca some sort of a capital improvements budget is something that we really need to uh, spend some time thinking about. Uh, part of it depends on settling this fund balance policy. We have a lot of financial resources, particularly sitting in very short-term investments with Brown Advisories. I, I think we're gonna be able to free up some of that money and address some of the critical needs that the town really has. but. Uh, you know, we've got some work to do to get there, but I think that's an important thing to pursue. Thank you. Very good comment. Commissioner Stevens, comment. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I agree with Gary. Uh, we, we need to take an approach to our town that's longer than a year. We need to be looking out into the future, what we need to do for infrastructure, what do we need to support the lifeguards, the police, town hall, et cetera. So I, I agree with Gary. We need to take a much longer view than just 12 or 14 months out. Thank you, sir. And then mayor's comments. I, I just want to do a little bit of thank yous to people here. I, I was the one that initially asked uh, Commissioner Persinger and Commissioner Stevens to take on the, the problem or the issues that we need to deal with the auditor on, need to deal on with the auditor. And they did a great job so far with the town manager and Jim Deedes and, and Sheena and Commissioner uh, and uh, excuse me, there was somebody else I've missed. But anyway, uh, Julie. Julie Johnson. Julie, Julie Johnson, Johnson, yes, correct. And there's three or four items concerning the auditor that they're addressing and are going to come back and talk to the, to the uh, rest of the commissioners about. And these are things that have been put off for years and they're now addressing them. And I personally really appreciate Commissioner Persinger and Stevens. Uh, taking that on and doing such a good job. Commissioner Jasinski, I personally also appreciate, and the other commissioners appreciate you taking on the part-time parking issue and, uh, and or half-day parking issue. And it's probably something we should have had before this. And then Mr. Bauer, uh, the marketing, uh, had a little rough start with the first meeting, but the second meeting got it all straight with Ashley's help. And... Uh, and the idea of them taking on part of the budget and, and a fundraiser really, it, it's gonna help the town. I appreciate all you commissioners and the town manager and the town attorney and Ashley and everybody because you're doing a hell of a lot more work than I am and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. With that, I'll take a motion